Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. It's a special JF, I'm going to call it a JFK panel um, episode. More about talking about the JFK assassination because from all my independent talks with all of you guys, Larry, we really haven't had a JFK discussion yet, but I've started to learn a lot more about the JFK assassination. And I think if you're a young, young person like myself, not saying you guys are old, but saying a young person like myself looking into a scenario like this, it's a very, very messy and very, very kind of um, a lot of loopholes, I would say. And, and with talking with um, Paul, about uh, what he would call these chokeholds in the investigation, things that you can get lost into, whether that's the interesting things like the skull fragment or just so much stuff with the book suppository building, Oswald, everything that we're probably going to end up discussing in this episode. These chokeholds to me seemed like alternative plans, like you have 100 people running a race and you only have one winner, but you have other methods or other ways out, I would say, depending on if your plan had a slight bump and go into a different direction. Um, during this episode, people are going to be joining in, so I can edit out sound, but just so everyone's aware when a random screen pops up. But I wanted to give, you know, you're all experts in this concept and understanding a lot about the JFK assassination, as well as everybody I think is marked on the Kennedys and Kings website besides Larry. And I respect all, all of your opinions through all the individual chats we have, and I think that we can have a great discussion about this, um, starting with JFK, Paul, welcome to the show. Um, didn't want to just leave. Can yeah, okay. Can you speak for me real quick, Paul? Pardon? Yes. Uh, okay. Just make sure I can hear. Very quick. <laughs> um, like I said, the JFK topic is a messy one. So if you're outside eyes looking in, you can kind of be distracted by the immense amount of information. I think Oliver Stone's film was a great way of kind of introducing me to the whole topic and the discussion of JFK. Um, from the lone gunman theory to the magic bullet to so many other things that are out there, one thing that I can come to the conclusion to, whether everyone here agrees or disagrees, is that the important part of this is, is that our the president was killed, and I don't think we're going to have an answer of who did it. I just... From my own opinion, I don't think that we're going to have an answer. I know Oswald, everyone says it was Oswald. Well, there's a lot of evidence to point that it wasn't Oswald. There's a lot of stuff that doesn't add up. There's a lot of documentation and there's a lot of things that aren't really solid evidence and probably wouldn't last in court if it was proven to that aspect of things. And I think that there's some people that run by the same narrative that Oswald is the lone gunman and there's no other thing about it that a magic bullet killed the president, you know, made seven wounds in people. And also, um, yeah, it, it, it just, it didn't make sense. Even saying it out loud really doesn't make sense. So I kind of wanted to walk through everyone's, you know, at any moment, you guys can talk about something that you find important that needs to be added in. But I wanted to talk about why, like my idea of the central intelligence agency or this giant kind of secret part of the military might be the thing that led to the assassination of JFK. And I think what I do is if you look at after effects, for instance, if you look at the Phoenix program or if you look at Watergate scandal, you can see clear evidence and documentation that there were some weird or really dark routes that the Central Intelligence Agency or whatever you want to say has been going on to a bad path, which I think brings better evidence to the fact that the Central Intelligence Agency only evolved to get to that point. And we can go back even farther to some other things. And I think the assassination of JFK is a clear mark that this is when they slipped up. This is when they did a really shabby job of trying to wrap up or trying to do their act and they got caught. And I think that's the first glimpse of light we saw into something that would be this idea of a deep state before that word was kind of hijacked in a sense. I mean, um, anybody have any thoughts on that? I think that what 
I mean, what, what I have concluded is that um, there are many questions. It is a, a, a big can of worms. But I think the preponderance of evidence indicates that the president was killed by his enemies, enemies within his own government. Um, I think that there were two plots involved. There was a plot to kill the president, and there was a plot to arrange for the blame to fall on Oswald and Cuba. That plot fell apart when Oswald was captured alive, and Oswald was then silenced in order to protect the plot and to make him what he said he was, the patsy. That's kind of my broad overview of the case right now. I think that the revelation, the most important revelations that we've had since Oliver Stone's movie is Operation Northwoods, where we see a clear template for the November 22nd crime, staging a spectacular crime on US soil and arranging for the blame to fall on Castro. What happened in Dallas was a spectacular attack on a US target and we immediately see US CIA assets seeking to blame the crime on Cuba. So that in general, I think is, is what happened on November 22nd, you know, identifying the particulars of who was responsible. Was it a CIA plot? I don't, I don't even think we know enough to answer that. Certainly I would say on the psychological warfare side of it, on the blaming Cuba side, CIA people were involved. Were CIA people involved in the actual assassination, the actual attack in Dealey Plaza? I don't, I, I don't think we know. I, I don't think we have a good identity of, a, of, a deal, of other Dealey Plaza gunmen. Um, so I think there's a lot of imponderables there, but I think the broad outline of the story has become clear. And indeed, as it was clear to people at the very top of the US government at the time, Harry Truman's column in the Washington Post a month after the assassination is a clear, in which he calls for the abolition of the CIA, is a clear indication that the 33rd president suspected foul play emanating from the CIA in the death of the 35th president. There is no other possible explanation for why Truman came out for the abolition of the CIA after Kennedy's assassination. So Truman's suspicions were echoed by people like Bobby Kennedy, Jackie Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and, uh, and other senior figures in the security establishment, Fletcher Prouty, Winston Scott, um, and members of the political establishment. Joseph Califano um, and others. So Richard Russell. So we have a broad feeling at the top of the US government privately held that the president was killed by his enemies. Um, and we have a template for the crime in Operation North Woods. And you know, that's what we're trying to fill in now is that picture. How did, how did this unfold and how was the crime concealed? And uh, just to confirm what you were saying, with William Colby as well, too, Colby was one of the person that exposed the dark route that the CIA was heading in towards. Um, I have a thing I pulled up on my phone here. Mr. Colby, the agency's director of covert operations, was left with the task that violated every precept of a secret agency, compiling a list of the deepest secrets, and the list went on, growing to 693 single pages. The agency had violated its charter by spying on Americans, tapping their telephones, reading their tax returns, and opening their mail. It had plotted to assassinate Fidel Castro and other foreign leaders, and it also conducted LSD experiments on unwitting human guinea pigs. So, that's Operation Midnight Climax, but it just shows that there's evidence behind or there's weight behind the fact that the Central Intelligence Agency or enemies, in a sense, the people that are filled up into these agencies. Now, I don't want to tear down establishments. I'm not anti-government, but I think you have a lot of bad actors that necessarily, if you don't agree with the narrative that they're spinning, they're going to try and find a way to get you out. Now, necessarily, is it easier today if you could just slander someone's character and say that they did all this stuff and then you get them impeached or something? I don't know. But if you look to a concept of the extreme scenario where the president was assassinated, um, I, I just found it really interesting, which is in Oliver's film, he mentioned the FBI analysis, the CIA analysis, and uh, the Warren Commission's analysis of it. Now, the CIA analysis talks about a shooter from the front. So I don't know what analysis you're talking about. There in in the the film, Jim. Maybe you can speak on this as well too. In the film, there was a depiction yeah. of how the. <laughs> Since I wrote the script, I think I can. Okay. Okay. That's from Gerald McKnight's book. <clears throat> okay, and there was a CIA analysis uh, done by Bregoni, and then uh, Horn uh, got another witness, okay, and they concluded that their analysis was completely different than either the Warren Commission or the FBI, all right, 
uh, they concluded that there were likely shots from the front, okay, and that Kennedy was caught in a crossfire. And I think David Rohn fished this out and, and gave it to Gerald McKnight, and Gerald McKnight puts it in his book. And of course, Horn, because he's so eager to uh, discredit as a Bruder film, he went further and found another witness uh, who, who furthered th that analysis. But th the reason that's in there is because I was trying to show that, you know, nobody could figure out what really happened because the, the, the whole thing was such a mess, you know, uh, to begin with at, at, at the start. And, the, and nobody had a grip on, you know, I think Elmer Moore said this, the Secret Service agent who was detailed from Washington to, uh, to be their guy on the ground, you know, in Dallas, Fort Worth. And he told uh, Jim Gokenauer that he couldn't make heads or tails of, of what had really happened because the, the angles did not line up, you know, with what was supposed to be, uh, at least at that time, the official story. All right. And so out of this morass of, of material that's accumulating, Arlen Specter decides that he needs this magic bullet, okay, in order to, you know, cinch the, the case on Oswald. And without it, I think everybody here knows this, that uh, the Warren Commission itself said that without the magic bullet, you have two shooters. And two shooters equals a conspiracy. I think it was Redlick who said that. I think that's in Epstein's book, his, his, his first book. All right. And so out of necessity, Arlen Specter finds this, what do you, I don't know what you're going to call it, a deus ex machina, you know, to, uh, to save the, the verdict against, against Oswald. And, and this is really, you know, as much as you study this case, the thing that really, at least for me, is very bothersome is uh, that these guys were all lawyers, you know, and, and Earl Warren, a few months before, had decreed that even indigent people should have a right to counsel, you know, in a court of law. And they actually made a movie out of this and they made all the difference in the world in that particular case, because the second time around, the guy uh, was acquitted. But in this instance, for whatever reason, you know, they, there was never ever given any kind of, even like a discussion that Oswald should have had the right to counsel. And it's, it, it's a, when you read Mark Lane's letter to the Warren Commission, and you read Rankin's reply, it, it's really something to read it, it, because the excuse that he gave was essentially secrecy. That we, 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 a lot of these FBI documents, we, we, we can't make public, all right? And so that was the reason that they refused to have a right to counsel for Oswald. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> the, the common joke among lawyers is that, you know, uh, a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich. OK, you know, and so if you don't have any attorney and then the, the, the prosecution could present anything they want to you and you don't have a right to cross examine. OK, and you don't have a right to bring in your own experts, then the deal is, 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 is essentially done. You know, and, and I believe that is really the, the worst sin of, of the whole Warren Commission proceedings is that they deprived the whole defendant of his right, you know, to speak at trial. If I may weigh in, uh, Robbie, uh, you know, I, when we say we'll never figure out who uh, carried it out, I think there are degrees to which we can figure it out. Now, just how thoroughly we will figure it out remains to be seen. Uh, but if you take uh, the garrison investigation and the people that followed in those footsteps, I'm including Jim, William Davidi, Joan Mellon, 
Then you take Gaetan Fonzi and what followed in the investigation around Miami and everything, and I'm including uh, Larry Jefferson and, and others. Uh, you you kind of have a picture because I, I always saw it as two angles to it. And, and getting back to what Jefferson said, I, I'm thinking more of ZR Rifle Jefferson, where you know the whole idea by uh, that William Harvey put together for an assassination was how do you get to it to it for it to be blamed on a foe? Okay, so getting it blamed on a foe in this case explains why uh, Oswald became very visible with the Fair Play for Cuba committee activities. So crazily visible all of a sudden, and I think that's the moment where he was being set up as the patsy. And if you analyze that, you get the propaganda side of the, the assassination. And I, I honestly think it heads back to someone like David Attlee Phillips, you can't be 100% sure. But when you think of that TV interview, that he had, okay? There's a TV interview where he's debating Carlos Bringier. Who set up the DRE, which uh, Carlos Bringier is part of? Well, you have David Attlee Phillips, who is in charge of disrupting or getting inside the Fair Play for Cuba committee, which Oswald is part of, it's David Attlee Phillips. And then right in the center of all that, you have Inca, which is the Ed Butler, which is a prob propaganda machine for intelligence. Uh, it kind of gives me the feeling that David, David Attlee Phillips has his fingerprints somewhere. There, okay, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Now, I, and when I read Larry's uh, work around uh, the training that's going on in Miami, and, you know, you get into the uh, Rodriguez family and Morales, there's a hit, a hit operation going on. So you got propaganda on one side and you have a hit on the other. And I think that if you look at that, you're going to find people of extreme interest in the Morales surrounding, and you're going to find people of extreme interest in the propaganda side on the David Phillips uh, 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 network. So in terms of solving it to exactly who the shooters were, maybe not. I'm not sure that's all that important, but in terms of, of seeing what the strategy was and, and you know who some of the people who the most likely and I think Larry you refer to them as a cater right a cater of like-minded people who were very good in regime change who took care of our bands who were part of the uh, Cuba um, so anyway that's that's my thought on on how we we get there and, and one final note is if you had gone the route of trying to blame it on Cuba you didn't mind a front shot as long as that front shot came from a, uh, you know, a Castro friendly person. And, and that, 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 that to me is, is what was in play. But all of a sudden, when someone says, hey, you know what, uh, we don't want to open a war up against Russia, or whatever the reason was, we have to go the lone nut route, you have a hell of a mess to clean up. And that's where everything got messy. So it's, it's kind of my view of, uh, 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 of, uh, so, of, of you know the operation so uh, this is how i throw that in and yeah see. yeah i'd like to uh, i'd like to comment on uh i talked to bill simpich about this and we kind of feel that there was not a not a second plot but also a third plot and the and mexico city is the key to everything and it and that uh, lays um mexico city the CIA had to be involved because Mexico City was a CIA station that was where Oswald was sent and people impersonated him. But what uh, what Bill and I were talking about is not only was there a plot to kill Kennedy, and, but there was a plot to blame it on Cuba, but there was also a plot to make everybody cover it up, to, to make the CIA look bad because of Mexico City to make the FBI look bad because they didn't watch Oswald. And to me, uh, when you, you know, of course, it's David Attlee Phillips is there, but behind him, there's the guy in the shadows. And you know who that is. James I, Angleton. Okay, that's what I thought <laughs> See, you were going to say. So, so if, if James Angleton knows all the inner workings of Mexico City and knows the CIA, how the CIA works, if Oz, if if 
if Oswald is set up there and impersonated before the assassination, he is setting up the CIA to have to cover it up because they look guilty. I mean, that's my intake. That's my uh, input on it because Did, uh, didn't, it was Northwoods. I'm, I'm convinced it was Northwoods. Well, uh, it, ab absolutely. Operation Northwoods was a plan to blow up a jetliner over Cuba or blame it on Cuba, right? Oh, there were multiple. There were, there were multiple Northwoods plans, but they all followed one template: stage a spectacular crime on U.S. soil, a terrorist attack, a plane hijacking. There were many different scenarios, but stage a spectacular attack on a U.S. target and blame Cuba. That was the template for all the Northwoods operations, and that was the template for November twenty-second. Now they actually had a, a plan that if. Um, when uh, John Glenn went up in the in the space probe, if he had been killed, they had a plan to blame it on Castro by electronics uh, surveillance. If they were they were in interfering with somehow with the spacecraft with electronics, they had that written out in case he. <laughs> they were ready to blame Cuba for that. Now, that was part of Northwoods too. With Angleton, what was his? tie in with JFK because I know William Colby ended up dismissing him from uh, duty um, at some point. Angleton, Angleton's office was in control of the Oswald file from November 1959 when it was opened to November 1963. So over those four years, Angleton's office was called the Special Investigations Group, received all the reports that came into the CIA about Oswald. In the course of those 48 months, the CIA received, that we know of, at least 42 different documents on Oswald. Those were Office of Naval Intelligence, State Department, uh, and CIA-generated documents. There were 10 communications about Oswald to the CIA in the last nine weeks of Kennedy's life. So I, Oswald is a figure of interest in the CIA, does not decrease over time, the interest increases over time and increases as the assassination gets closer. All of that paperwork is going into Angleton's office. And on October 10th, a whole bunch of people associated with Angleton and Dick Helms sign off on a cable about Oswald's presence in Mexico City. So you have high level interest in the accused assassin six weeks before the assassination occurs. When the assassination occurs, the CIA immediately puts out a lie to the FBI and they say, we only had five documents on Oswald on his whole time. That, that lie was foisted by Angleton and then repeated to the Warren Commission. The Warren, and in January, 1964, the Warren Commission is told a very important lie by Helms in a memo to Rankin. He says, we didn't even know that Oswald had visited the Cuban consulate until after the assassination, okay? And the Warren Commission buys that. It's a preposterous lie because when Scott knew all about it and the, the surveillance of, of Oswald was a, in fact quite extensive through cameras and, and, and wiretaps. So what the CIA is immediately trying to do is to get rid of this idea that we know anything about Oswald in Mexico City. And they had to get rid of that idea to the Warren Commission precisely because they knew so much, okay? When Scott is kind of not in the loop on this whole deal, He's, he had once been friends with Angleton and he becomes quite suspicious of him and later concludes that Oswald, that, that Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy. So those, those kind of high level doubts even go to, to somebody like Wynn Scott. And for good reason, because he knew that Angleton and Helms had fed the, the Warren Commission a, a, a bunch of lies about Oswald in Mexico City. And he knew it from personal experience. Well, saying they have five files on Oswald when they were watching his like phones and everything for, or, or reading his mail for like four years, like it just doesn't make sense um, that you wouldn't have just ha five files. You'd have extensive more. The one thing that I thought was weird, which was like an idea of when they dropped the threat on Oswald a week before the assassination, was that to pin him to be this type of thing of like, oh, he realized the threat was dropped so he could go and assassinate the president? I don't know what you mean when you say the threat. I, was I think, are, are you talking about the Geesling thing? Yeah, the FBI thing. Yeah, the, the flash report. Yeah, yeah, yeah take, flash, right. taking him off the security index. Well, certainly what, what, what the same day that, 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 that Angleton's people send the cable to Mexico City about Oswald, 
That's the same day that the FBI takes Oswald off the security index. What that meant was if Oswald had been arrested anywhere in the United States, the FBI would immediately report that arrest to headquarters. The idea was Oswald was a figure of interest as long as he was on that list. So Oswald goes to Mexico City. He meets with Cuban and Russians who are presumed correctly to be intelligence officers. Angleton's people get that report. They write a reply to Mexico City, basically saying, pay no attention to that fellow Oswald, kind of downplaying him as a security problem. Um, and that same day, the FBI reduces, takes him off that security index. List. So John Newman says, you know, like somebody seems to be turning, dimming the lights on Oswald at that exact moment, October 10th, 1963. And that is in fact what happened. So yeah, that, you know, Oswald was a figure of high level interest that, and the interest was very carefully managed. That's the point about, about what was going on there. I'd, I'd like to add something about this that uh, I think makes it even more interesting. You know, um, I have the good fortune, I think a couple of these guys also do, to be a, a friend of Malcolm Blunt. Malcolm Blunt is one of these guys who you don't see on these kind of shows. OK, he's one of these guys who just stays at his house, sends away for documents, reads the documents thoroughly and then sends them out to people that he thinks would be interested in it. A few years ago, he sent me a set of documents from a woman that I don't think most of the people in the research community ever heard of. Her name is was Betsy Wolf. Betsy Wolf was the person on the HSCA who was tasked with going through Oswald's file, okay? Now, Jeff and John uh, found out that there was something odd about Oswald's file in the 90s. Well, this woman knew something was wrong with Oswald's file in the 70s, okay? She, 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 first thing she asked for is, I want every charter from every division in the CIA, okay? And so, and she got them, all right? And then she read through them. She actually read every single charter. And from reading all this material, she mapped out, well, this then is what should have happened to Oswald's file. And she came to the conclusion that it should have gone to the SR division, all right? Well, then she looks at what happened and guess what? It didn't go to the SR division, all right? It went to this very secretive um, section within the Office of Security, all right? And so she was very puzzled. Well, how the heck did that happen, all right? And so she started bringing in all these people who would know about these mechanics of how the CIA worked and how files were distributed. And then in, I think, October of 1978, Two months before the HSCA disbanded, she did an interview with a guy named Gambino, who was at that time the uh, chief of the Office of Security. And he said, look, it doesn't matter how many copies of a document is coming in. It doesn't matter if, it's a, if, if, if you want it to go to a certain department, okay? If the customer intervenes with what he called the Office of Mail Logistics, okay, it will go to only that department, all right, because you have the system right at the beginning channeled. And so she realized what had happened, that somebody had rigged the system about Oswald's file right at the beginning so it wouldn't go to where it should have gone. It would have gone to some place it should not have gone, and it's and 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 this I I thought this was really and 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 by the way, do you know how explosive Betsy Wolf's work was? It was never typed up in memoranda form. It's a really good thing that she had very good penmanship, you know, and you could read everything that she wrote in longhand. All right, but and and of course because of this. It wasn't in the volumes, it wasn't. So Jeff and John had to like start at a point that was actually behind Betsy Wolf in trying to figure out Oswald's file, all right? Larry, did you wanna say something? 
Yeah, I, I'd like, and it, Jim's, that's a very good point Jim's making. It brings together the whole Angleton scenario, but I'd like to go back and, and respond to something that Gary introduced, which I think has added a huge amount of complexity into this whole thing. And that is what he remarked about three levels of, or three elements being involved, not just two. Uh, operationally, I agree with, with what a lot of Jeff said in terms of this operationally being a standard, deniable, covert assassination project. These, these guys, you had case officers that have done this before, and we know who they were, and you can, you can tie them into this, this assassination. But the, th the fascinating part of this is there's something different about the JFK assassination than all those others. Because if you read William Harvey's notes, or if you look back in these, these other operations, you find that, yeah, there's a patsy. There needs to be a patsy. And if all possible, the patsy is going to relate to an adversary of the US, whether it's Russia, Cuba, whatever. The thing is, in this case, it was always supposed to be a deniable patsy. In this case, they come up with Oswald as a patsy. And as Jeff pointed out early in the show, and as a lot of Jeff's own works point out, Oswald was not a lone nut. Oswald was not disconnected from the intelligence community. Oswald, you can, you can look at what's going on in Lee Oswald in the summer and fall and find evidence of him all over the place as known to, associated with, being used by the CIA, if not the FBI. Certainly, Jeff has done a great job of showing how visible Oswald was within the DRE, how visible he was in Miami to JM Wave. So why would somebody introduce a patsy who has fingerprints of intelligence all over him? You know, it's like, wait a minute. Yeah, can you connect him to Cuba? Sure. But if somebody looks too closely into this, there's some other connections you don't really want to explore. And I think that's what Gary was raising is somebody planted, and I, I know it's been called a poison pill, but whoever inserted Oswald as a patsy went a step further and made sure that a lot of information about Lee Oswald was going to have to be withheld. A lot of people were going to have to line up behind the lone nut scenario so that those other questions would not be asked and it would force the withholding of a great deal of information. Whoever, it's Angleton, maybe it's Angleton, maybe it's people at JM Wave who are very much aware of what's going on with, with Lee Oswald and some political action activities, some propaganda activities. But this third element of contamination is really important because Lee Oswald was not your standard type of arm's length deniable guy. There was way too much surrounding him that was incriminating if you dug just a little bit under the skin. And who was in charge of Oswald from day one? It was Angleton. Clear uh, back certainly. to when he defected. So who would be the obvious person to use uh, to know that he could use Oswald to cause a cover? I mean, that's but of I course, it, I, as I, Jeff I has pointed out, there are people in JM Wave that know a lot about Oswald. Yeah, you know, you talked about Mexico City. There are people in JM Wave who are, who are already doing, uh, you know, impersonations in Mexico mm. City with Amots, uh, yeah. with the JM Wave Morales. station yeah. people Morales. with Morales. So, I, yeah, I, I'm with you, Gary. I, Angleton's kind of at the top of the heap in my view, but I think we can dig even more deeply and say, okay, let's take this down in the field to who, who might be given the day-to-day -day instructions. So is it safer to say that there's people inside the intelligence agency that were maybe just making their own moves in the course of where they wanted their moves to go? I mean, there's a lot of evidence to support that as well, too. It, the, the difficult part about here is that there's a lot of aspects to touch on that I would like, like, I mean, there's a lot of different things from like a skull fragment to magic bullet theory to so many other things. But one thing I can never really get over was Oswald was 24 years old. And there's this huge 
blatant public, uh, I guess, a, a narrative that's being spun out there that they somehow did all this under the government, like was able to surpass all these aspects of the government, whether you want to, that's sticking by the lone gunman theory, but also the fact of how complex it gets, the more that the Warren Commission, as if you want to accept whatever their statement is about it is, but to be able to somehow still baffle the Warren Commission on so many aspects of things too. I mean, there's even things with the with the original rifle, the original name that was given on the receipt or whatever that the rifle was ordered, um, which you would just go, if you're going to assassinate the president, would you keep a receipt or anything like that of the rifle that you own that's going to incriminate you? And also when me and Paul were chatting, if you look at the photos of Oswald, uh, where he's holding up a rifle in his backyard. Now you can take that the stock and the, you know, that didn't match the one that they found, but you can also look at the fact that there's a photo where he's holding a rifle. He's got the 0.38 on his side and he's also holding the pamphlets for Cuba on his, in his hand in the photo and him saying that, that, that is my face, but I don't remember that photo ever being taken. They could say, maybe he's got a bad memory or you could say they somehow manipulated the photo. Now, I don't know the technology extent of how photo manipulation and things are at that. I just don't have that knowledge for it, but I mean, it's, why would you hold all three things in like, that's just a dumb thing for a photo. I mean, I get people taking a backyard barbecue photo with a beer. That makes sense. But even that you're holding all three things that are going to incriminate you. And you realize that this one 24 year old, where I was like, hold on, if he could do all this, I got to run like a stop sign or something. Cause I'm the same age and I'm not that cool, but it gets into this aspect of like, there's a lot of outlets where they were trying to pin him and they had multiple different ways too. depending on if this went this way, there was this way to get him. There was this way to get him, And there, there was this way to get him. where you realize it's a complex situation around one person. But also if you look at the other assassination attempts as well, too, I mean, they all kind of fit the same profile and the overall goal was to blame Cuba for it. So, Rob, let me give you it's not that complex because I'll just I'll just give a perfect segue to Jim. The point is, let's let's look at two things. If you can make sure that there is no defense attorney and there's nobody in play to question any of that evidence of any sort. OK, that's so there's none of it's going to be challenged. There's nobody in the room to challenge and raise any of the issues that you just mentioned. And if you can make sure that the agency that's going to be the criminal investigation actor in the play, and re remember the Warren Commission only had two real investigators that were sidelined in Dallas early on. The only people that are going to be allowed to enter evidence are the FBI. And you know that the day after the assassination, well, Sunday after the assassination, the FBI has been directed to report, write a report on Oswald as the only person being involved. This is not really that complex. It just with those two points, there's no defense and the prosecution is totally focused on it's this. We know how it's going to come out. And I think Jim you left, you left out, uh, you left out Alan Dulles being on the <laughs> Well, yeah. Okay. So a little more stacking of the deck, but I mean, you, you know, from that Sunday, how this is going, you know, when the Warren commission internal document says, you know, we can't trust what the FBI is telling us, and they're the only ones giving us evidence. You know how it's going to play out. And, and you know, it, and again, being an old person, I said I use the term establishment. I also use the term CYA. Cover your ass. Now, you know how this is going to play. <laughs> if I may add, Larry, you, you know, you also have to add context, Robbie. Perhaps you're not as familiar as the era before Facebook, social media, and all that. So, if you lined up the press back then, like they could easily and tell them to get in line. And it was at a time where people trusted government. I mean, if you look at the turnaround in terms of trust of government, you can see how it just drops and starts plummeting after the assassination. Then you had Vietnam and Watergate. So, you know, to, to control the message back then and to control uh, the, the, the whole legal system inquiry was key and the evidence. So, uh, you know, you began with Life magazine publishing that photo, right? And say, oh boy, let's convict him in the eyes of the public. And uh, people were perhaps a bit more gullible, you know, and were willing to believe uh, what they were being told. 
you know, and then you get Earl Warren, who said, well, he can't be lying, you know, he's the chief justice or the old. So look, uh, I don't think they would have, well, they may have attempted it today. Anyway, but I'm just saying that back then, you, um, they thought they could get away with it. And what did Alan Dulles say? People never read anyway. So, uh, you know, Paul, so Paul, it began yeah. earlier with life. Because if you recall, oh, yeah. Paul Mandel wrote a article, which I believe is January the 6th, in which he said Kennedy turned around. And when he turned around, this is when Oswald hit him, okay, with the front throat shot. That's how it happened. Okay. And now, can you imagine how big a lie that really is? Because Life magazine had the Zapruder film at that wasn't that, Dan, wasn't that Dan, um, uh, Dan Rather that did that, said that? No, no. Dan no. Rather is a guy who said Kennedy went forward in the okay. car. I thought it he was, it was said Paul he turned Mandel around to wave and got was, hit in the throat. No, no, I don't think that's Rather. Paul Mandel wrote this article. Okay, and it might have been even earlier, maybe December the 6th, okay, in which he said <laughs> JFK turned around towards the Texas School Book Depository, and this is when he got this, because, see, the, the problem was very simple. The problem was Malcolm Perry had that afternoon press conference at about, I think, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, in which three times he said Kennedy was hit in the throat from a, a shot from the front. And so they had to find a way to, to disguise this. And so Mandel, now I would think that you would look at the Zapruder film before you wrote an article like that. Now, do I know? I'm not sure not? Mandel had access to the Zapruder film. Right, right. Okay, so- They locked it up, put it away, that was it. But the thing is, how could you make a mistake like that? It's, it's, it's unbelievable, you know? Well, it's, it's even more embarrassing. I think. So he he makes the mistakes, Jimmy. You're totally right. But then what does life have to do? They have to reverse the sequence a couple of the frames when they print it, right? And you say, oh, well, we just made an, our editor made a mistake. You know, like the most important issue you ever printed and you had one editor and he just made a mistake and nobody caught it. Like, oh, come on. So Man Mandel is stupid, but you want to talk embarrassing. <laughs> Why would Life magazine spend this and it was enormous amount of money in those days for the film and then print three frames and then lock it up in a safe in New York City for 30 years? How do you make I mean, this this they're a, they're a company that's in business to make money. They how could they why would they do that? Well, they were in, they had to be incentivized to see the idea that like the media was scared that they couldn't report or they couldn't cover the stuff. I just don't think it, you were incentivized really in good gracious not to. I mean, if you reported and you dug deeper into this and you kept prying, I mean, do we saw well, we see the accounts of all the number of witnesses that have were afraid to speak out. It was getting scary for them. I think Larry you even wrote a book about some of the witness experiences as well, too. You get into this era where you had airtime probably more if you fit the narrative it's the same thing that's not as happening now we could talk about the media today being different i don't think it's really any different in the case maybe there's more scrutiny on some things but there's also a narrative that they agree with as well too i mean if you look at the uh, who is it roger Feynman, the guy from cbs it was that came out with a report saying that they weren't going to go against the official warren commission statement or something like that like you were incentivized really in your own good business not to talk or deny the report or say that there was a conspiracy whether you thought you were going to stop the country from going into a war with russia or you were just afraid of something might happen to you i mean there were people like perry that were pressured to change their opinion after that statement for instance i mean there's a lot of stuff that where i see where i kind of link into is the media manipulation aspect that the, the government aspect the stuff that's still linked on today now i'm not as expertise i would say as you guys are with names and that type of stuff but i can definitely look at like more of a, a an angle when it's like it's not that far like conspiratorial to think that you wouldn't talk trash on the people that maybe might help you get more airtime or stay on the air or access, Rob, it's all about access. I mean, news magazines of the time are kind of like reporters today. You want access to the information before your competitors got it. That was even more important back then because you were doing weekly magazines, you know, 
And, and we have many, many examples where reporters that was, you know, Dulles was an expert at that. Angleton was an expert at that. They distributed information. So you didn't want to piss them off. I mean, if you want to maintain your reputation, if, if a reporter wants to get a Nobel Prize, which we've got an example of reporters who were fed information from the CIA, I shouldn't say Nobel Prize, but a Pulitzer, you know, access is the key. You're right. It's no different now than it was then. And you, if you have access and you're getting lead time on stories, it's just that simple. You don't give it away if somebody asks for a favor. Hey, you guys, if, if I may just interrupt, Jim, when you come up, I'm going to show you this book. It's by life. Okay. And this is their, this 1988. Now listen to this description of the bullet that struck uh, Kennedy. Okay. Uh, he had already been, okay. Yeah, listen to this. When Kennedy came back into view from behind the freeway sign, he had already been hit, striking no bone, the first bullet pierced the back of his head and exited <laughs> from his throat below the Adam's apple. <laughs> Here's some other one, the back of his head. This is okay. Life Magazine, 1988. Okay, wow. so it's a book. <laughs> oh, well, I'll send you that. I mean, it is at, I mean, back of the head is the highest. And, you know, I don't think Gerald Ford wrote that one either. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but, you know, the, the comment on the media today, you know, what there is is more of it. OK, because the broadband and the Internet revolution has allowed a lot of uh, people that who wouldn't have had access uh, to large, large groups of people. It's given them an opportunity to, to actually do that, which was impossible back in the, in the 1960s, you know? And so the, the fact that there's more of it, you know, and somebody like Jeff, you know, can actually get a major story, you know, in something like political, which, reach, which reaches millions of people. So in that sense, it, 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 it is different. And back then, back then, you know, as, as I did a talk a few weeks ago, I said, the media was so controlled back then. And there was so few outlets that it was really a double-edged kind of a thing because the consumer of information didn't have a lot of choices, okay, where he was gonna get his information from. And on the other hand, if your object was to control the flow of information, it wasn't that difficult to do. And so that's why that at the beginning of this case, you know, there, 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 there really wasn't a lot of ways to get really good information. You had to go and there, and there was this small circle of what we call the, the, the first generation critics who really did try and do it but they had to go to like the National Archives. They had to travel around the country, et cetera. It wasn't, it wasn't easy to get really good information back then, especially with this giant, uh, what did Wisner call it? Uh, his organ or something? The like organ, that? yes. Yeah. Wurlitzer, yes. Right. You know, playing that, that uh, you know, that beautiful musical instrument he had, you know. If I can add to that, because the first article I wrote was about, I had done an analysis on how history books right, the cover right. the assassination. Yeah. And most of them, you know, don't even recognize the House Select Committee on Assassination. I mean, they go right back to that earliest investigation, which was the um, Warren Commission. And, uh, you know, I was able to question the authors. And honestly, they didn't know that there was a House Select Committee on Assassinations, most of them, okay? So, no, it was a lone nut. And if you dug a little further, who was influencing the, um, the academia at the time? It was the CIA through Max Holland. And he was writing up articles on, here's how you should write about the assassination. So, you know, I think it was all part of Mockingbird, Operation Mockingbird. and you know, it kind of, kind of rolled out of World War II, right? Eh? Because they were all one big team against the enemy, and I think that network of, of communications kept going. And uh, you know, you say, hey, good, look, you, we we need you to help us on this one. And uh, 
you know, there's a list of the Mockingbird journalists. They're available. Yeah. Many of them. Yeah. Well, that, that's Bernstein's great article in the, yeah. in the Rolling Stone. But l l l let me tell you an interesting story about this. Um, uh, I, Bob Tannenbaum lives in LA and, and I, I go over and see him every once in a while. And since he was a deputy chief counsel for the House Select Committee, uh, he has a kind of high profile in the case. Well, Dan Rather calls him up. I believe it was in 1992 after JFK had debuted. And he interviews uh, Tannenbaum and David Bellin in, in Dealey Plaza. You know, Bellin is, uh, you guys probably know this, he's an estate lawyer. OK, he, he's not a criminal lawyer at all. OK, but and on the other hand, that's all Tannenbaum did for about 10 years was do criminal cases. He was like the, the chief of homicide in New York City. All right. So Bellin goes first. All right. And then Tannenbaum, he and then rather gives the mic to Tannenbaum, you know, and Tannenbaum does, I guess, his great, you know, the, his usual thing that, you know, with with this kind of evidence, you couldn't convict uh, uh, Oswald and you know and and so the mic goes off and <laughs> there goes the tan of them you know something we really blew it on the Kennedy case <laughs> yeah you did Dan you did <laughs> now okay so one thing I had a question about is when it comes to the a bullet from the front what about when they when they took the, the 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 vehicle in and they fixed it up and it was back you know they they released it. What about the windshield? Like there was a clear mark that there was a windshield. Um, there was a crack in the windshield, which they took the windshield out and replaced it. They they sent the whole car to to Detroit and rebuilt the whole thing. I have a picture. There, there's pictures on the internet of the bullet hole in the windshield, and there's a real good video on YouTube of a doctor, a woman that worked at uh, Parkland and that she went out and saw the limousine and they interview her on this uh, video. And she, she is, uh, said that she had, no, she had no doubt in her mind that the bullet went through the windshield. Gary, wasn't there someone at the, the uh, Ford Motor Companies who also witnessed that you saw the whole too? Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the most dramatic tapes I've ever heard is researcher interviewed the supervisor at the Ford Motor Company that did the window change out and, and absolutely, you know, they were, they were destroying evidence covering it. Uh, in the interview, he's interviewing the man who is the supervisor and his wife is in the room and his wife is totally panicked throughout the whole interview. She's telling him to shut up. You don't talk. You're going to get us killed. I mean, this is as sincere as you get. And this guy is just kind of plodding on. And this woman is in the background going like, oh, you're just going to get us killed. <laughs> but yeah, the, Rob, the answer is that, that they reworked the whole. It wasn't just, I suspect, just the window. There was other damage inside that car. Very possibly bullet strikes yeah, through the frame floor. At the top. Yeah, that was reworked. And that as I understand it, it was driven, you know, immediately uh, to Ford virtually to do that. So j just another example of the Warren Commission had no chance. <laughs> I mean, they really, I, I, I'm sorry, Jim. Yeah, they could have done a lot better job. But I mean, at that rate, when people are concealing evidence and altering evidence, like all you're going to see is what we want you to see. It's like a movie, right? It's only, only what is in front of the camera is going to make any difference was it was that doug weldon larry yes yeah and that's online i don't think it's online i heard him actually play the tape i've never heard it online oh okay i'd love to hear that yeah, yeah we had at a conference it would have been i forget which conference i mean it would have been recorded as part of the conference but he just, he just it yeah okay well then so how valid is the zapruder film because I keep hearing people say that it's edited, and then is it is it frame three thirteen? If I'm guessing that number correctly, three thirteen. So I mean, what do you guys stand on the Zapruder film? Is it a hoax? Is it fake? Because I've I I fall in the more of the lines if we can crop a photo with Oswald and say that they put his face on uh, it, that wasn't him. He never took the photo. If we're going by that standard, then I can understand that it can maybe the Zapruder film could be a hoax. But I'll what I, I, I I'll sit this one out. I'm an agnostic. I'm on the ZipRooter film. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, I've seen the argument by the filmmakers who say that the film was doctored. 
Um, they were supposed to make a documentary about it. They never finished it. So I don't, I don't think that case has ever been proven. Um, Doug Horn thinks that it was altered. <clears throat> I think that that's a very subjective, uh, a very subjective call on his part. Um, uh, and so, you know, I'm like Jim, I'm, I'm agnostic, but I think that uh, even if it was doctored, it's still a damning document. It still indicates a shot from the front. Dr. McClellan agreed that the shot came from the front. Um, other, other of the Dallas doctors had that same thought. So I think that the, the argument about the alteration of the Zabruder film is a big distraction and uh, shouldn't really detain us too long. Uh, I, I, I may just add, is it Robert Groden who, who analyzed it? If you put it in sync with the Nick's uh, film and much more that they kind of they kind of match up time-wise, you know? So I think that's what I've heard. Again, I'm agnostic also, I'll say that. Right, if, if, if the film had been doctored, um, they would, it would not sync with the other motion pictures of the time, right? And if, if, if you look at the Nick's film and the Zabruder film, the car is in the same place at the same moment. So I, I think that that's a sign that it, it was not doctored. Well, I've been using that good. film to go off the basis of a lot of my conclusions about everything, especially when I was talking to Gary Aguilar, where he said that there's only three types of nerves in the brain. And the way that the, they described the magic bullet is that when it hit and it went into this part of the skull, that it hit a nerve and it went caused him from going forward to jerking back. But if you look at the Zapruder film, it's a clear shot that from someone from the front hit him in the head. I mean, the angle that the body falls, it isn't a, a forward and then back like that. The way that it goes is a complete like it just got hit from the side which goes back to what i was saying about the cia where they drew their kind of of how it happened and they said that there was one from the front and then two from the back and i go i mean if you are the ones that did the assassination or if you attempted the assassination then why would you have the most accurate report that would just incriminate yourself you'd want to be as far off from the truth as possible but also if you're doing your independent investigation or you're doing your investigations independently from the warren commission's idea from the fbi's idea and the cia's idea then you probably think well everyone's gonna think it came one bullet came from the front so then you did that and then that wasn't what everyone else had well, I think, Rob, there's, there's, a, there's a strong argument that essentially the basic film is correct, and, and, and this is very interesting. Uh, and that argument is actually made by something that Doug Horn covered in detail in his work, and that comes from the NPIC evaluation and the two sets of storyboards, which, which Jim mentioned earlier, and the fact that when, that, when the film, Z Film, came to the National Photo Interpretation Center, first they made a set of storyboards and they took those storyboards and they did a briefing at the highest level. CI director Johnson may or may not have been there. Certainly National Security Council level people, they did a briefing. Then those storyboards were taken back. The next day, another set of storyboards, this is same film. So what you're really doing is okay, I, I did an evaluation of the film, and this is what we think happened. And, and then you do another set of storyboards telling a different story. The second set of storyboards is entered into the official record and goes to NARA, okay? The first set of storyboards, I suspect, everybody assumed would be destroyed immediately, okay? But then later during the House Select Committee, somebody... Yeah, everybody is going, well, it's being investigated again. Do you have any evidence? Somebody goes to the, the chief at NPEC and says, you know, we still have this set of storyboards over here, which is the first set of storyboards. And there's, there's documents on this. There's correspondence. And the guy goes, no, no, get rid of them. No, we don't want those. They shouldn't even be here. You know, to me, that's the essential argument of, yes, the C film is, yeah, did somebody screw around with a frame or two, but essentially the story the Z film tells is true. And it was so damning that it, in the very beginning in that briefing and, and McCoy, it, we now know that uh, the CI director within a week is telling people, yeah, I think there were multiple shooters. That's because of what he saw in that first presentation 
from the storyboards is, is my speculation. But yeah, I think it's an argument in favor of the Z film. Arthur Schlesinger says that Bobby Kennedy, in his diary, Arthur Schlesinger says in early December, 1963, Bobby Kennedy told him that he had just met with his friend, John McCone. And McCone had seen the Zabruder film and McCone told, Kennedy, told RFK that he thought the president had been hit by gunfire from two different directions. That's um, what I was thinking of. Good, Jeff. Yeah. 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 Also, keep in mind the Zapruder film wasn't widely available. So, what did Life Go and do? They showed sequences, just frames of the Zapruder film and inverted two frames to make the front movement, uh, sorry, the back movement uh, less apparent. In other words, uh, so Life who again, as Jim said, had the Zapruder film, <laughs> you know, they knew what they were doing. And uh, so that's, again, uh, you know, media, mainstream media selling the public and framing the, the evidence in the eyes of the public, you know, uh, for uh, public consumption. And that's definitive. And that's an acknowledged and admitted, admitted to. I think what Robbie was referring to earlier, I think what Robbie was referring to was the fact that Groden had sunk up the film with the acoustics evidence, which, which he did for the House Select Committee on Assassinations. But um, his preferred synchronization uh, was vetoed by Blakey, okay? Uh, and he said that he thought that was the best synchronization that he did, all right? But Blakey, of course, as we know, told Don Thomas, you know, look, you're lucky if I can sell these guys four bullets. You're crazy if you think I'm going to sell them five. Okay, you know, it's just not going to work. Okay, and so that's what he had to do. You know, so, but, but, but Robbie's correct. But when you see that synchronization, it's very compelling. Okay, you know, so yeah, I saw, I, I remember seeing that back in the 70s. I thought it was, I thought it was very strong. So, when it comes to the prior assassination uh, attempts, were they just like for the main assassination, just pinning Oswald and Oswald being a patsy, were they they weren't trying to target him the whole time? Did they have a list of people that they were willing to have sacrifice or be the patsy in a scenario with um, or or at least try to attempt to kill the president? And Oswald, I'm not saying he attempted to kill the president. I'm just saying they had other people that they were focused on pinning the blame on or having this act performed the first attempt and the second attempt. So was the third attempt, the idea of trying to find an answer to the whoever shot the president or whoever took a shot from, if there was a shot from the book suppository building, you don't need that answer because they didn't, they weren't looking for that answer. That's why we don't have a name. That's why when someone in the community or the forum or whatever on Facebook suggests like, give me a name then if it wasn't Oswald. Well, they weren't looking for one, so you don't have one, but you got to look at a concept of Oswald, like was being onslaughted in multiple ways just being blamed for this whole scenario which made me go who was the person that was trying to incriminate him and picked him out of everybody i get his whole profile was set up but you're basically it's like wagyu you're bred into this thing for one specific purpose like i mean they i've seen many documentaries now that have painted them in a bunch of different lights one specifically painting him saying that he hated his family he seemed like a kid that wasn't loved but then you're finding letters and documents from russia to his mother where it's like if you weren't loved by your parents why are you sending letters to your mother a lot of stuff isn't adding up where i just go i don't really expect like people to be like oh this is the evidence that comes out that's going to expose the jfk truth but there's a lot of people still fighting over the same exact concept i had someone tell me like at my work say that just go to that book suppository building and stand up there and you'll know one man could easily make three shots. And I'm like, what evidence is that? There's none of that, but there's plenty of stuff countering that. There's a Harper fragment that nobody knows where it's at. I'm guessing it from what I saw was that the family physician was the one that holds that piece or that's locked away somewhere. Or do we just not know what happened to the Harper fragment? Because that's a piece of skull bone that was found that, I mean, if you look at the autopsy, I don't know. I couldn't really tell from that, but there's a clear mark in the back of the head where half of his, who is the, uh, I'm going all over the place. I'm sorry, but there was a late, there was a lady that took a, many photos for the Kennedy family and she saw the autopsy and was like, he's never looked this bad before. Yeah. The Harper fragment was found by the uh, the son of a physician, 
in Dallas, I believe the day after uh, the assassination. Okay, and so he took it uh, to a hospital in which uh, there happened to be a forensic pathologist there. All right, and so the forensic pathologist, I think this is the only forensic pathologist I actually saw it. Okay, and and he says this is from an occipital part of the skull. All right, then what happens? And somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. But it then goes to Washington, and I think it was, was Berkeley the last guy to see it, okay? I think Berkeley was the last guy to see this thing. And then all we have now are pictures of the Harper fragment. We, we, we don't, nobody really knows uh, where it is, all right? David Mantic, you know, who has done a lot of really good work on the autopsy, you know, he's convinced that it comes from the occipital. He agrees with that first forensic pathologist that that it came from the occipital part of, of JFK's skull, which is really an, a, a very important deduction if he's accurate, if that's true. Well, there was a bunch of witnesses that drew a picture of a hole in the back of Kennedy's skull right where that fragment. Was yes, in. yes. But just to Jim, uh, the pictures were taken, by the way, just to be precise, by those original physicians that received the fragment the first time. They had taken nice pictures, and they're not pictures from, you know, whoever got them in, in uh, Bethesda or wherever they ended up. And I, I heard that the, the physicians, I read the same thing, that if you looked at it has to do with the sutures or, you know, sort of where uh, brain uh, uh, skull matter connects. You can tell what part of the skull it was from, and they, they judged that it was occipital. Yeah. See, the, the medical evidence in this case really exploded with the ARB, okay, because the, the ARB did a, a pretty good job in getting all of the uh, House Select Committee uh, documents on this subject matter out, okay? You know, I have a lot of disagreements with the ARB, but in that respect, you know, they, they did a nice job. And, uh, and, and we were very lucky because at that point in time, you had a set of new doctors who got interested into the case, okay? And then people like Gary Aguilar and, and people like, you know, Dave Mantic, you know, got interested in, and Joseph Riley, Okay, they got interested in the case and they really did a tremendous job in digging in to these documents. And one of the most compelling things that they came up with is that, I don't know how else to say this, the House Select Committee lied uh, when they said that there was a divergence between the physicians in Parkland and the medical personnel at Bethesda, okay, that there was a difference between whether or not they witnessed this hole in the back of Kennedy's skull. Well, Gary Aguilar did a superb job in assembling a chart that said, no, there was not a difference between these witnesses. There was actually a convergence between these two sets of witnesses and 40 some people saw pretty much the same thing, you know, and, and this, of course, you know, the irony of this is, you know, it goes back to Kemp Clark, you know, Kemp Clark and McClellan very early in the case said that there was a hole in the occipital part of Kennedy's skull, you know, and that's what these guys saw, you know, so I, I we made a point of including that in the film when Gary talks about that, because it's a very, I think it's a very, very important piece of evidence for this case well you mentioned a lot of important things in jfk destiny betray but gary also mentioned when he was like i was mentioning earlier about the photographer who took many photos for the president she said she had never seen him look this bad before now you gotta understand yeah he was you know shot in the head but at the same time like the one thing that she said he goes and there was a brain sitting in the background of one of the photos like they had the autopsy already set up like a stage okay you're you're talking about sandy spencer yes she actually wasn't a photographer uh she was a technician 
who worked at the Anacostia uh, photo lab. And you're, you're, you're really right, though. She, Jeremy Gunn, who was the chief counsel of the uh, ARB, and on the scale, I would, I would put Jeremy's a conservative guy. Okay, he's he's not uh, Morningstar or anything like this or Fetzer. Okay, he's I I put him right of center. Okay, if if I had to, you know, he thought that she was the best witness that the ARB found. Okay, because what see what she the significance of Sandra Spencer is that she saw a set of photographs that was different than the extant photographs that that we have in the collection today okay and as you say she saw a picture with that had actually had a brain you know sitting in the frame all right and so one of the things that we tried to prove in the film okay is that the pictures of the brain and evidence today very very difficult to believe that it's actually belongs to Kennedy because there's first of all it's 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 1500 grams the average brain weight is 1350 okay uh 11 or 12 witnesses saw a brain that had a significant amount of mass missing from it about a third of it okay was gone that's not what we see in these pictures and Stringer of course when he was confronted and and by the way I, and I, I have to since I kind of took a shot at Jeremy a minute ago I have to give him some credit for this. Jeremy Gunn did a very, very smart thing in his examination of John Stringer, who is the official photographer of record. And it's, I really wish a, a, more attorneys would have done this in this case. He got Stringer on the record before he showed him the evidence. Okay. So therefore, he couldn't adjust what he said to what he saw, which is a very serious problem that we have in this case, all right? And so he questioned him outside, okay, what kind of film did you use, okay? What kind of process did you use, okay? And did you see a severely damaged cerebellum? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> Jeremy takes him in, shows him the photographs, and according to Doug Horn, Stringer was at a loss for words when he saw this stuff. And so Jeremy says, you say you use Kodak Ektachrome. Is this Kodak? No, this, this looks like Ansco to me. Okay, you know, it, is that cerebellum damaged? And he goes, no, it is, didn't you say it was damaged? Yes. And he goes, <laughs> so it was a really, really a great piece of lawyering, which we don't see in this case very often, you know? So I have to give Jeremy a lot of credit for that. Well, well Gary he did. He and Doug Horn did the same thing, and, and and I think this there's certain things that really tell the whole story without you know elaborating it. When they question the lead autopsy doctor, it just just do some show us something simple. Here are the official photos in evidence of the president. Just show us, point out on this photo where the entry wound was that you guys found. Yeah, something real simple. We you know. Yeah, we know that in a real court trial and there should be, have been Mark there, but show us. And he comes back and says, well, no, I'm sorry, I can't do it, but I hope you guys figure it out. Now, I mean, <laughs> after, after that exchange, why would anybody even take anything at Bethesda seriously? I, I'm like, OK, let's just not even go there. Well, I think Gary mentioned in the autopsy when they were originally doing a, like a tracheotomy on them without noticing the whole back of the head that was blown out, but they took the brain out. And what I'm trying to kind of show here with like the preface of like the government and like how the power of the government has that have a lot of power um, is mentioning about the medical evidence as well, too. The ones that we have in the documents that a lot of people go, well, here's the documents to say otherwise of what your conspiratorial thinking is. It's like, well, they they mess with the documents. Those aren't right. I mean, the original photograph of the brain has a whole right part of the head that's distorted and messed up. But then the one that they have in the archives is necessarily, it doesn't show that. It shows a perfect brain where some of the people who even photographed it said, I never took one of that, that shot, that angle, that, that that's, not my, that's not my doing. Yeah, well, the, the Stringer said he did not take in what he called Bassler 
okay, which are from below. Okay, that's another difference between his testimony and what the what the evidence is. Okay, but the, the, to, to add to what Larry said, another very compelling part of Jeremy's investigation was when he's he's looking at Humes's report, okay, and he says, Dr. Humes, in your report, you describe an ascending slope of particles in the back of Kennedy's head that goes up to near the top of his brain. Okay, uh, can you show me those particles in these x-rays in front of you? And, and <laughs> Doug Ward said that, Jim, I swear to God, if Jeremy would have asked him one more question, he would have turned around and left. He was that frustrated, you know, because he couldn't, they're not there. They're not, they're, they're not in the x-rays. So what the heck is he talking about? You know, is that... <laughs> You almost begin to feel sympathetic at some point. It's like, I don't know what's going on. And they told me not to talk. Okay, come, give me a break. <laughs> and, and the thing is, that's one of the reasons that the, uh, um, the Ramsey Clark panel and the House Select Committee panel, they did their little you know, switcheroo by changing the entrance point in the rear of the skull from low in the skull to near the top of the skull, what was commonly called the cowlick area, all right? Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that, that, that they had to do it. Yeah? And uh, I think the other reason they had to do it was the sudden, here's another do sex match in this case, you know, the sudden appearance of the 6.5 millimeter fragment, okay? Which again, if, if, you, if you read Jeremy Gunn's examination of Hume's, you know, about this, you know, he, he puts it right in front of him and says, do you remember seeing something that big, you know, in, uh, no, I, <laughs> I don't remember seeing something that big that night, okay, and it's by far the biggest fragment that there is, you know, in, 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 in the x-rays, so that's another reason they switched it around. Didn't, wasn't one of the photographers asked to take a picture uh, and put a, a 6.5 fragment in the picture. And I, I read that somewhere and I can't remember. No, I, I, I don't think I remember. I don't remember hearing that. I don't remember I had, hearing that. I do. Um, he testified to somebody that it was after he had taken photos of the brain. They came back with this bullet fragment. They made him take a picture of this uh fragment in, in in behind the brain and i can't remember who it was crockett no uh, i can't remember I, i'll have to look it up yeah i read that somewhere well if we go to from manipulating the autopsy or basically with the autopsy still falling down the lines of what the government could do to make the the narrative fit that they wanted to fit we can also point to gary where you talked about at the funeral home with oswald's fingerprints um, the black smudges on his hands as well, too. That's how they got yeah, it. That, that, that happened. That's true. Yeah. So, <laughs> if you wanted to explain the videos that. on YouTube, I think, of, mm. uh, of Rudy talking about it. Well, could you explain a little bit about it? Just Oh. All right. Let's when they. Uh, after Kennedy was killed. Dallas police had the rifle and uh, Lieutenant Day was looking at it for hours. He had it, he had it all day. Then the, then the FBI came and took all the evidence and they sent it to the most sophisticated lab in Washington, the FBI lab, and they couldn't find any prints on it either. So then they send it back to Dallas and uh, Day gets the gun again. And that night he miraculously finds this palm print underneath the stock of the rifle. And, uh, then we see this video of Grudy, who was the undertaker that did Oswald, uh, embalmed him. And he said that late at night on, I think it was Friday night or, or Saturday night, I can't remember, these men in suits came to the funeral parlor. He didn't know if they were FBI, CIA, who they were. And they asked to be alone with the body. So he let them go in and be with the body for a couple hours. And they leave, and after he they left, he went in, and Oswald's 
hands were covered with ink. They had lifted that print <laughs> and put it on. And, and here's what's really funny that if you read the testimony of Day, I can't remember his first name. Does anybody remember? No. Carl, maybe, yeah. Anyway, the, the Warren Commission got suspicious of his testimony, that he how he found that print late. And so there was talk among them, and they said, we should interview him again. We should get him to, so they wanted to call him to Washington, and he refused to go. <laughs> he said, no, I'm not. I, and, and then they said, okay, well, that's okay. <laughs> Can, can I play devil's yeah. advocate on just a yeah. part of that? Let, let me explain. I, I mean, first of all, I don't believe in the finding the latent palm print. But could they have argued saying, hey, since we did find a print on the rifle, well, of course, we had to match it with Oswald and lift the print, uh, you know, off of it. I, I know it's ridiculous. Yeah. But I mean, but, but could that be the argument? What am I getting wrong here? Hmm. Yeah. Oh, they had his palm prints? Yeah. Or... They had, yeah, they had all his prints. They booked him. They they fingerprinted him a couple times. I yeah, finger, but palm. Well, yeah. when they do it, they probably do the whole hand, you know. Yeah, maybe. But... I, 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 look, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I mean, yeah, they, yeah, the FBI yeah. didn't find it. They well, didn't even, find it. all right, even if it was his palm print underneath the stock, he, if he owned a rifle, he, he, at some time he cleaned it or something and touched doesn't mean he did the shooting. No, I mean, it's, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'd like to comment on this because PBS pulled a very, very ugly stunt. OK, when they tried to go ahead and say that uh, these secret set of prints that nobody ever seen before. All right. were we're really, you know, Oswald's Pat Spear did a very nice job showing that that was not another set of photographs okay it was uh it was blow-ups of a previous set of photographs that the dallas police 30 years later were going to try and pass off as being finger fingerprints so again talking to tannenbaum he said jim look sebastian latona was the number one expert in fingerprints in the entire 48 states he goes, do you know how good this guy was? He wrote a pamphlet that every police department in the country used <laughs> to teach these guys how to read fingerprints, all right? If you tried to get him as a witness, you had to request him six months in advance because every DA in the country wanted this guy to testify in his case, okay? He was that good. So... It's Sebastian Latona, and by the way, and Latona in his Warren Commission testimony is very specific about this. He goes, I couldn't find a blasted thing. Okay, I mean, and, and we then broke down the rifle, he broke down the rifle into all of its parts, and then he brought in his own photographer. Okay, and this guy brought in his set of lights, and he goes, we did everything. You know, we sidelighted, we highlighted, we did everything we could to bring out any prints of value, and, and we just couldn't do it. You know, so in my opinion, Sebastian Latona is 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 a very good authority on 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 this subject. You know, I'll take his word over days. Well, how long did this all of this information start to come out? Like, what year was it when a lot of these documents, or all, all, at least this amount of information, has came out? Like, this wasn't in like a ten year span. Fifteen. Well, no, no span, actually, it, it it wasn't. It wasn't so much the documents. It was the very fact that, like at what Alan Dulles said, print everything, nobody reads. Well, <laughs> Alan made a, a little mistake because there were a few people who did read, okay, who, who did read those commission volumes, okay. And then they supplemented it by going down to NARA and, and reading some other stuff and actually watching the Zapruder film. And so around 1967, you had what we call uh, you know, the first generation of, of critics who actually read the 26 volumes. And as Barry Ernest says in the film, he says, the Warren Report is pretty convincing if you just read that by itself. He goes, it's when you read the 26 <laughs> volumes and you realize that, wait a minute, this doesn't always match up with what they're saying in the 888 page report. Okay, and that, and when you, and these people, 
I, I of course, I, everybody here knows who they are. You know, Sylvia Marr, uh, Mark Lane, uh, Harold Weisberg, okay, uh, Tink Thompson, uh, Richard Popkin, to name a few. Okay, uh, when they began to compare this, they came to a quite different verdict, okay, about did the evidence really support the conclusions in the 888 page Warren report. Now, I always like to point out whether it's related or not. Three months after the volumes were published, Johnson sends the first combat troops to Vietnam three months later. All right. When Kennedy was alive, there were none there. In my opinion, the reason I bring that up is that the MSM missed not one story, but two stories. Okay. You know, did Oswald really kill Kennedy? And was there any major changes in policy as a result of that assassination? Hey, Robbie, I'm going to have to bow out now. I've got another call shortly. All right, Jeff, so, do you want to promote your book real quick before you go? Uh, uh, my new book, Scorpion's Dance, is about the CIA and Watergate, which might seem not related to the Kennedy assassination. But part of the book, or a key part of the book, is to point out that the politics of Kennedy's assassination reverberated at the highest levels of power in the United States and very much affected the relationship between Richard Nixon and Richard Helms, which was key to understanding the Watergate affair. So JFK is a subtext to, 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 to Watergate um, that is not visible, wasn't visible at the time, but we now know, and I, I think I show in the book, was very much a matter of deep mutual concern to both Nixon and Helms. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Uh, it, it comes out tomorrow, and uh, yeah, you can order it on Barnes and Noble or Amazon. Um, it will be uh, it'll be available tomorrow. Uh, I'm not selling any right now, um, uh, just by arrangement with the publisher. I will eventually be selling my own copies through JeffersonMorleyBooks.com. Yeah, well, well, Jeff, I'll link your blogs and I'll link the links to your book in there as well too. It was a pleasure having you on. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. See you, guys. And how much weight do you guys put into the aspect of MK Ultra being involved into this? Now, hear me out before you start going conspiracy. I had to go conspiracy since Jeff isn't here anymore. I feel like he was he, he's a good I love Jeff, but I, I got to be serious with Jeff because I messed up our first episode because it was my introduction into JFK where I've kind of have all this information in there now. And I want to toss out some stuff with you guys. Um, MK ultra, how much weight do you guys put into it? Because the autograph or the receipt on the rifle, for instance, is, is it heck? It, what is it? It's high he Heichel or something like that. How do you say it? I do. I do. I, so it's, it's Jackal and Hyde is how it, the, the, mm -hmm. the, 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 the thing is spelled out. Now with my interest in MK ultra, when I was a young little wee little toddler, I'm just kidding. When I was actually in, actually, I was probably a wee little toddler in high school, but <laughs> Jim <laughs> walks away. Uh, but <laughs> when, I, when I was in high school, I was studying MK Ultra, and there was a certain experiment that happened where they had uh, an account of someone that was in a room and every day this person dressed in like an, an outfit, same kind of like nurse's outfit, but had top half of their like they had a hat on and the bottom half of their face kind of covered now they would drop this tray in there the person didn't notice because after a while you just got used to someone coming at the same exact time after the number of days and weeks started to blend together at the same exact person that was dropping the tray from day one was not the same exact person that was dropping the tray the rest of the same days they had a person that was the exact same height exact same weight but different facial features where i start going if you look at the oswald imposters did they have a bunch of people that fit the template of Oswald, same height, same weight. I think Paul, me and you mentioned like how many people dress the same back then where the same style of stuff. And me and you showed a photograph of what they called the Oswald imposter. He didn't look like anything like JFK, but if you really kind of examine from like a distance and you're already kind of assuming in your head that this is Oswald and you just got him, you're more than quick to just jump to the conclusion of that. And next thing you know, make a call that Oswald's in Mexico. When later there was a document saying Hoover saying that it wasn't Oswald in Mexico. So I start going with the MK Ultra angle. If you just had a bunch of people that could say, well, I saw like, for instance, in the Tibbet case. So 
if you look at Tibbet and from what I've learned about Tibbet, there's an account of Oswald and Tibbet having an interaction at a diner. Now, was it Oswald or was it someone that looked like Oswald that was just using his name? Imagine you go around town saying, yeah, I'm Jim DiUgino. I created the amazing mm-hmm. film JFK Revisited. Look at that. Uh, JFK, I didn't actually create it. Okay. You're, you, <laughs> read, you wrote it and it's amazing and I love it. All right. Thank you. Um, but it, imagine if I go around town saying that and then if nobody looks it up on their cell phone because they don't have cell phones back then, they're eventually just going to believe it. And they're going to be like, this is this person. Oh, yeah, I saw him at that diner when he was never at that diner. My thing with the Tibbet thing is I don't when we talk about if he shot the president, and then he got down all those flights of stairs, which no one on the stairs that came down at the same time said that they saw him there, which you think that someone would have saw another person in a small stairway. Um, you would see someone else come down. But if you go to where the Tibbet thing is, they were just looking for someone. They were like with Tibbet. Apparently what I've heard from someone that wrote a book about Tibbet said that he saw someone that looked suspicious and looked like this. And they, that's when they interacted and he was killed. Now, what I go to is imagine if you know that you hear shots or you're going to, the president just got assassinated. And this is from Oswald's standpoint, you go to this aspect of, Oh my God, they're going to blame me. Cause it seemed like he was already getting pretty paranoid as it, as it was if you look at oswald's kind of history in a sense it seems like he's going through a little bit of paranoia i'm not saying paranoia as he killed the president jim i see you making a face like what is he talking about but i'm saying paranoia in a point of you know you're about to be set up for something you didn't do so i mean if you robbie are you are, are, you, are you 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 buy dale meyer's argument that oswald shot tippet no, I'm just saying you're going to get blamed oh, okay. for something Th- of that thanks. sort. That's a, that's a relief. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, you should have Joe McBride on your show. Uh, he wrote what I believe is to be the best book on the Tippett case. Uh, it's called Into the Nightmare. All right. Very, very interesting and, and, and complete book. Well, All right. if, if you go by the paranoia angle, like I'm saying, then you can understand why <clears throat> if he was in Russia, he was trying to get rid of his U.S. citizenship and defect to Russia. I mean, then well, they- no, actually, Robbie, that that's a very uh, f- a fine um, Snyder, who we know today was a former CIA employee, actually made sure that he went up to a line but he didn't go any further, okay? He didn't let him renounce his citizenship, which indicates to some people, including me, that Snyder knew that Oswald would be going back uh, to the United States at, at a kind of indefinite time. So that's why he made sure uh, that, he didn't, um, that he didn't renounce his citizenship. Did, did he do that with Webster too? Uh, no, Webster actually got Russian citizenship. Oh, he actually did drop his. He city. did. He was he was a Russian citizen. It took him a year. At first, he applied for it when he got there. I mean, when he defected, uh, he he asked for citizenship, and they turned him down. They said you have to wait a year and then reapply. So he waited a year and he reapplied and he got the citizenship. And right after he got it, his father wrote to him and told him that his mother had had a nervous breakdown and all this stuff. And he decided that I'm going back home again. So then he came in to the United States on the Russian quota as a Russian. And interesting, he had weeks of interrogation. And not unlike Oswald, who just came back and nobody cared. Weeks, after he, weeks of interrogation? He had a couple of weeks. And he was interrogated by the CIA, everybody. And wow. in, even, a, even a congressional group. And they gave him tests. They sent him to Pittsburgh. This is really strange. I have a document that uh, actually it was Malcolm might have sent me this. There's somebody from England sent me this document. It's probably Malcolm. Probably was. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, in the document, his wife goes on to say that they took him to Pittsburgh and they gave him these psychological uh, testing and and, and all this stuff and uh, IQ tests and give them psychological help. In other words, therapy or something, which, you know, reeks of MK Alter or whatever. But he finally got in 60, 
six, I think he got, or 65, he got his regular, he, he got American citizenship back. Oh, okay. He became, he became a citizen again. But what's interesting about that, it's in, I have that in my book when I researched the defectors, I call it the Saturday, Saturday strategy. The uh, embassies officially closed on Saturday. And it's interesting that Oswald goes there on a Saturday and throws his, his passport down. Of course, the embassy's bugged and the Russians are listening. And I, I'm, I'm loyal to Russia and I'm gonna give them secrets, I'm gonna do all this. And he throws his, his passport down and Snyder says, well, you can't defect today because the embassy's closed. I mean, you can't turn in your, you can't give up your citizenship today. He says, come back Monday. He leaves his passport with Snyder. And of course he didn't go back on Monday. And Snyder protected his passport. So when he was ready to go back, he had it. And that, would, that all sounds good, but there were more. I think it was Petrelli, Petru, Petrucci, same thing, Petrucci, Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they mm. come in on a Saturday and the embassy's officially closed. If it's closed, why is Snyder there on a Saturday? That's you know, a good I mean, question. I was going to ask you that. <laughs> exactly. If it's, it's closed, why, why is he working? You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's so suspicious. So what that is, is I call the Saturday strategy. You come in, throw your passport down on a Saturday when we can't process it. And then you can always get it back later, you know, protection. So. See, see, like, you know, when, when you talk about this stuff, uh, it's like Richard Schweiker said, you know, Oswald has the fingerprints of intelligence all, all over him. You know, and he and, and he said that back in 1975, you know, and I think we included that in in, in the movie because it's it's coming from uh, a very, you know, solid Republican, actually Republican source. Well, the co-chair, you know? right? The co-chair of the committee. Um, yeah, he okay. him and Gary Hart were the co-chairs yeah. of the subcommittee. Yeah, you know, on, on that specific investigating. Point you know, the performance of the intelligence communities in the JFK case. I, I think, Robbie, you, you can conclude from all this is that there was a false defector program going on at the time that Oswald entered, and there were some other Marines that entered like him, and they were there on a mission, right? And another point that you can look at, and this is, is clear, is when there were two, I forget their names, but there had been two uh, real defectors that had gone about a year and a half, two years earlier. Well, the investigation they did around that, uh, you know, those uh, two traitors was, I mean, so complete. It went on for months and months and months. And then when Oswald uh, is investigated afterwards, they have to kind of go through the motions, right? But it was very cursory at best. And even a lot of people who were questioned remarked, they said, well, we didn't feel they dug very hard. So it... it it, it, everything you look at when you look at what Oswald did in Russia smacks of a fake defector initiative. Then flash forward, what does he do? Is he comes back to the US. And if you analyze his joining the Fair Play for Cuba committee and opening a chapter there, and then his interactions with the FBI and being under, you know, the you know, all the right wingers that he's involved with that are intelligence connected. Well, that's simply a second mission. And I think if you see it that way, if you see him as a, a small time pawn, I don't want to call him a, a major asset or anything like that, but he's someone who has a use. Well, we use him here and now we're going to use him there. Okay. And uh, I, you can really see that he is following marching orders in both cases. In, in yeah. Max Good's film, uh, the assassination of Mrs. Payne. Uh, he he asked Ruth Payne. He goes, "Why would a white Russian like George de Morenschild befriend a communist like Lee Harvey Oswald?" Okay, and she says, "Well, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's it's a very good question. You know, which uh, which you know there really isn't a rational answer to." Okay, and unless of course you, you, uh, you take a look at what he told Epstein, you know, look, I would have never met Oswald in a hundred years if Jay Walton Moore hadn't told me to. Okay, you know, 
So you yeah. get this, you get this strange paradox of this supposed Marxist Leninist, okay, hanging out with these white yeah. Russians, you yeah. know, in the Dallas Fort <laughs> Worth area. And the Warren Commission, they just don't make anything of it at all. <laughs> no, you know? it's nothing. But 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 Jim worse than the white Russians is his Camp Street address. I mean. Can mm -hmm. you get more right wing than yeah. the, the yeah. Guy yeah. Bannister and the whole intelligence community? Yeah, right, in New running? Orleans, yeah, right. So in New Orleans, I mean, you look at where he's situated, he's joining the Fair Play for Cuba committee when it's on a downward world spiral, okay? In the worst place, the worst city, and the worst block that you could actually set it up on. And that's where he decides, and, you know, of course, who's... Uh, a stone's throw away from him, his good pal, David Ferry, who, you know, so, I mean, if you, you know, when you talk about the fingerprints of, ed, of intelligence, well, you're going to find a ton of them, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Dallas, or whether it's in New Orleans. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I don't see how anyone can call him a lone nut grifter when you look at who he's bumped into all this time. Well, when it comes to the amount of surveillance that was on him, what was the thing that made them want to pin it on him? Did Was there an act or some type of thing that he did that caused him to be on the bad gracious, or was he just a patsy type angle? I, I have an opinion on that, but I don't know if someone else wants to uh, weigh in. I think Larry and I discussed this. Um, okay, so um, uh, first of all, you know, his bona fides, right? He's married a, a Russian. He went to Russia. So he does come across, you know, his his sheep dipping is, uh, is one of being a communist, right? And one of a communist who also, uh, you know, may have been in, you know, in, in, in contact with the Russian assassination czar in Mexico and a Cuban agent. So, you know, to pin it on Cuba, you have a very good candidate. Um, the other point too, and, and I don't, I think Larry, you and I discussed this, is when he all of a sudden becomes visible in his leafleting in, in uh, New Orleans, he had a double mission because he was not only trying to collect names of communist sympathizers and all that, and probably feeding them to Warren DeBreeze or Guy Bannister, he was also asking to meet the FBI director, okay, in New Orleans, Warren DeBreez. And part of what he was doing there, in, in my opinion, was also talking about Cuban exiles who were involved in terrorism or were really, really militant. And, and I think, I believe that the Cubans were onto him. So he probably became persona non grata to uh, the Cuban exiles in New Orleans, who didn't trust him, and saying, well, this guy's squilling on him, we're losing, uh, you know, they're breaking in on every mission we're involved in, and so on and so forth. So he probably became very expendable, no matter which side of the fence you are on. That's, that's partly speculative. I don't know if you... Uh, if what you... I think is, I think he was, in, he was infiltrating um, these groups, probably for the FBI. That's, that's my take in New Orleans. He was infiltrating these groups. Of course, the Cubans found out about it, and he's perfect patsy. But he had to have been set up ahead of time. At Mexico City was a setup. So already we knew that this is a guy that we're going to go after. And then he gets the job in the school book depository. And then they move the route, the motorcade route, to go by the school book depository. And then as soon as this the shooting happens his description is going out and all the information about him being in russia and all they had it immediately it was through military intelligence or whatever so i mean it was it was a setup from day one it, he well, was going to be the patsy so, I, I would th i think we need to go back to that third level though that you were talking about earlier gary y you could have found other I mean, if you wanted to, if I'm running this operation, I want a real, real good patsy. The CIA obviously knows the names and locations of a lot of Cuban intelligence officers that are operating in the United States. You know, that there's there's no doubt about it. I could I could come up and the CIA is really good at this. I could 
I could come up with a frame. If I want photos, if I want tapes, I, we have examples of where they would interview guys and put together composite. They, they could have framed a real Cuban intelligence officer. Okay, they did not. I think my version of why they would pick Lee Oswald to frame is if you look at what was going on, and, and it's too bad Jeff is not here, but the level of information that was being passed from New Orleans to J.M. Wave to Emilio Rodriguez, or, or, Ernesto Rodriguez's brother, who was the guy that Oswald first went to in, in New Orleans, who recommended him to bring here. You know, th this guy's brother is senior political action officer in Miami. Yeah. If you look at the amount of material that's being passed from New Orleans to Miami, Jeff has even pointed out that the DRE is writing to Congress about Lee Oswald as being an example of how, you know, gullible young Americans can be entrapped by Cubans. You know, it, it gets better because it, for this level three, you want a patsy that does have fingerprints of intelligence on them. That if, if the lid is opened off what JM Wave is really doing in and around Oswald in Mexico City, probably Emilio's, Emilio's running actions against the embassy in Mexico City. He's also running actions against the UN embassy, uh, Cuban personnel. If, if any of that surfaces, it exposes the CIA connection to Lee Oswald. So my reason as to why, the, yeah, Lee Oswald, it forces a cover up. He's, he's not just a patsy. He's not just like, okay, fine. He is a patsy that will force a cover up. Uh, it's guaranteed that everybody will start lying through their teeth immediately. Well, well as, as we see in Mexico City, what, for the first 24 hours, it's almost like they start telling half truths or part truths. And it's like, then it's, there's no tapes. We didn't have any tapes. What do you mean tapes? We don't have any footage. You, got, you guys lost it. Um, well, it, it, it's kind of like, well, hold on. It's kind, of, it's kind of like tying a bunch of stakes around his neck and then pushing them bare naked into the middle of like Yellowstone or something like that. Like <laughs> they really, they, he was in charge of a lot of, in my opinion, a lot of sophisticated tasks. And it kind of was just literally just setting him up to be um, this escape route for them. But what I don't understand is the rifle that was found in the book suppository building, his wife said it was his rifle. So I start going, that means that someone. No, no. It no. wasn't his? That's a common misconception. Okay. In the uh, the Kunkel report, which is the first Secret Service report, okay, Marina Oswald, there were two things that the Secret Service was trying to get Marina Oswald to say, okay? First, that that rifle was Oswald's rifle, and second, that Oswald had been to Mexico City, all right? She refused to go along with either one of them at first, at first, okay? She says, Lee never said anything to me about Mexico City. He never told me anything about Mexico City, either before or after, okay? So I don't know anything. And then, by the way, she got, she got so agitated about this, okay, that even when it would come on the TV, she would look at the two Secret Service agents and go, no! Okay, he wasn't there. All right. Okay. So so then as far as the rifle goes, she goes, look, Lee never had a rifle with that telescope on the top. Okay. <laughs> I never saw him with that kind of a rifle. And they tried to get her to weaken on that too, but she wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. It wasn't until they turned her over to the FBI that she started like, you know, going along with the, oh yeah, he shot Walker and he took pictures and, and all this other stuff. OK, those first few days, she was a pretty good witness for her husband. Yeah. OK, well, as then far, why didn't she the rifle goes as far, you know, that's something. Why, why did she admit taking the picture of him with the rifle? OK, well, this is uh, that, that that's a pretty interesting question, because I don't think that that came until later. OK, until the, like I said, when she was turned over to the FBI. All right. OK, now, as far as that picture, the, the problem with that, with the House Select Committee came up with was that when they asked her to go ahead, OK, how did you take this picture? OK, and she did the usual this. 
<laughs> and they said, uh uh-uh. uh. No, no, it's this. With, with that camera, you have to take it like this. Right. Okay, and so and so and and this ended this ended up you know the secret House Select Committee report on Marina Ozzo, which I don't know if you guys you you guys have probably heard of it. Okay, why they ended up not not believing her? She said there were there were like thirty eight or thirty nine instances, okay, in which she differed from the accumulated record that they had. Okay, so they, they did not find her, you know, to be a very credible witness. And Larry Schnapp, to this day, says. You know, Marina Oswald would be destroyed, you know, during a cross-examination session. All right. Um, to, to, to get back to what I was, you know, to, to what I was going to say, you know, uh, in my opinion, which, which since we're, 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 we're talking about this, this whole thing, Oswald was, it's hard to find a guy better suited for what they wanted to do with him. OK, uh, because as, as the other people have been saying, you know, there were so many reasons for the FBI, for the CIA, et cetera, to run away from him. OK, you know, to say, you know, oh, we didn't know this and we didn't know that, you know, et cetera. OK. And so this induces this uh, whole, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, this uh, this whole uh, siege mentality, you know, with, with, within these intelligence uh, domains, you know, uh, and you know, one, one of the one of the really most sickening parts of reading the Warren Commission is to watch all these guys deny that we had any contact, you know, with with Lee Harvey Oswald. Okay, when in fact. If you would have taken a look, I believe, you know, Betsy Wolf, who I mentioned earlier, she said that by 1967, the CIA had 700 documents in the Oswald file. Okay. She said they weren't all from the CIA. Okay. I think she said something like 150 of them were from the CIA, but they had a total, they'd accumulated 750 documents pertaining to Oswald. All right. So, you know, you know, as as Jim Garrison once said, you know, the CIA will say that they didn't have anything to do with Oswald, but you can be damn sure, you know, then when push comes to shove, that they knew what he was doing in November of 1963. You know, and I well, look, you had Michael Payne in, I believe, April or May of, of 1963, telling the students at SMU, I've got this communist who came back from <laughs> Russia, okay, and he's staying in my house, okay? <laughs> Wait, that's how, they got, that's how they got the book wrappings on the rifle, right? Oh, well, no, that's a, that's a whole very interesting story, which... Uh, well, Gary explained you, you, a little you, bit to me. But... Oh, Gary talked about it? Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised he talked about it. Okay. Um, no, it's me. Yeah, Gary. Oh, you, I'm this not, Gary. I thought it was Gary Aguilar. Oh, okay. It's okay. two Garys here. Okay, right, right. <laughs> There's a Gary who's here and a Gary who's not here. Okay. You know, the, one of the biggest bullshit stories that the FBI put out was that Oswald had taken the wrapping from the Texas School Book Depository home with him. And he, well, look, this is a perfect example of what Barry Ernest was talking about. The Warren report is very convincing until you read the testimony. Troy West was the guy in charge of that table, that desk, you know, handing out all the paper. If you want to read something funny, go ahead and read Troy West's testimony to, I believe it's David Bellin. He is trying to get at least a little bit of leeway so he can get Oswald, you know, to that desk. And every time he tries to thrust, okay, Troy West does a beautiful fencing pit. No, 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 no. And finally, Bella just kind of gives in, okay? Lee Oswald did not get any of that paper from that. Troy West's desk. Okay. That's, that's completely bullshit. All right. But 
a very interesting thing that I think Sylvia Marr and then John Armstrong talked about, and which I wrote about at length in my book, is that there was a package sent to Oswald at Ruth Payne's home. And I believe it was at the post office on November the 20th, but there wasn't enough coverage on the stamp coverage on the package to actually arrive there. It had the wrong address. Well, actually, yeah. Gary, they had <laughs> pasted an address over okay. the original address. <laughs> okay, that, that's right. That, that's that right. was on there. Okay. And we're supposed to believe that the FBI, with all their, you know, the, all their chemical solvents, couldn't take that off. Okay. Mm -hmm. Said they no, but they couldn't. That's what they said. And so this package, Ruth Payne first tried to say it was magazines. It wasn't. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. It was a Carol Hewitt's actually actually saw it. She said it was a long strip of brown wrapping paper. Okay, that was in the package. Now, people like me who have very good reason not to trust the FBI, you know, uh, you know, in this case, I could easily imagine a scenario where, you know, that arrives at Ruth Payne's house, Oswald opens it up, goes through it, touches it, discards, fingerprints, just, yeah, discards the paper. <laughs> Okay, and then when the police arrive at Ruth Payne's home, okay, they find the wrapping paper, which they couldn't find, okay, previously. So that I think that's a very interesting aspect of, of the case. And let, let me, uh, since uh, I'm on the subject a little bit. Uh, Weren't they supposed to have found some at, in in the, uh, the somewhat on the sixth floor? Weren't they supposed to have found a wrapping they said with- Oh, was... oh well, wait a minute, Gary, that's, if you remember, uh, they couldn't take a picture of it somehow. Okay. <laughs> but, but, but later, but later they did, you know, come out with, okay. All right. But somehow they took pictures of everything on that sixth floor, but somehow they couldn't find the wrapping paper. And so they drew a picture of where the wrapping oh, okay. paper was. And, but there was, <laughs> they said there was, uh, wasn't there, was no oil on it. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Here's here's my Marcano, and I just have it in this bag, and it's covered with oil. <laughs> I mean, if he had wrapped something in that, right, it would have been it would I have agree. been covered with oil. Yeah, I I I, I agree. Let me, uh, you know, uh, I think Max Good's film is coming out, uh, I believe, in like a week. Okay, and it's called The Assassination and Mrs. Payne, and Max, let me let Max let me see it. Okay, because I'm going to be reviewing it for K and K, and you know, looking at the film, I I think Max kind of tried to cut it down the middle. Okay, you know, and uh, I wouldn't have done that, but th that that he's the director, so that he gets to do that. All right, and watching the film, you know, when I when I was done watching it, I said, why the hell did it take 59 years to make a movie? about Ruth and Michael Payne, you know? You really, really wonder why the hell it took so long, you know, because they're, they're such absolutely interesting, uh, compelling characters in this case who very few people have written about at any kind of a length. You know, the, the only people I can think of um, are maybe Armstrong, uh, uh, George Michael Levica in his book, A Certain Arrogance, and the series of articles that Carol Hewitt and Barbara LaMonica and uh, Steve Jones did for Pro Magazine uh, in the 90s. So this is a very, very fascinating, interesting aspect of the story because, you know, I don't have to tell you guys this, the Ruth Payne's garage <laughs> becomes the treasure trove of of evidence you know against lee harvey oswald okay on on the weekend of the uh, of the assassination and by the way it's not just that weekend because if you recall ruth payne was finding stuff 
weeks later <laughs> that somehow the Dallas police missed in their two searches of the house. You know, she just happens to say, well, well, here's a book I need to send to Marina. Oh, there's a note in here. Okay, it's a, the, 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 the so-called Walker note. Oh, that's it. That, I know. And the, and the Secret Service got so suspicious, you know, that, you know, they bring it back and go, we think you did this. You know, <laughs> you, know? And, you know, yeah, right. And then, of course, she finds stuff from Mexico City. All right. That, that somehow the Dallas police missed that also, you know. And then, then as Max puts in his movie, as Marina Oswald, told Jim Garrison during the grand jury hearings in New Orleans, because he was curious to find out, uh, why did you have this abrupt separation from uh, Ruth Payne after the assassination? And the Secret Service told me that I shouldn't be associating with her because it was too obvious that she was sympathetic with the CIA, okay? And Max does a very nice job of paralleling that with George DeMore and Sheld before the pains enter the picture, and then Priscilla Johnson after uh, the pains separate from the picture. Priscilla and, Johnson, and Priscilla Johnson was finding evidence of Oswald in Mexico City in <laughs> August of 1904, okay? And Wesley Liebler hit the roof when he heard this. He goes, wait a minute. This is eight and a half months later. The Dallas police, the FBI, and the Secret Service couldn't find this, but this woman reporter does? You know? <laughs> well, they were all Quakers, that's why. <laughs> Ruth Payne. Ruth Payne, Priscilla, <laughs> Robert Webster, they were all Quakers. Me and Gary touched on it. Um, Gary Hill, we touched on it about the movie theater where they found Oswald and how he had was it, it was half a ticket in his pocket. And right. it, it was talking about how was you a would, box top. Yeah, box top. A, how you would meet a, another spy. Um, you would sit next to someone in the theater and try and connect connect the box top together i've mentioned that and i mean you can t the jfk forums are they're not the most uh yeah intelligent well, you, bunch but uh, that's actually mentioned in uh, i think david phillips book that that's one of the ploys that they used or there i mean there's it's it's in several spy books you know this is what we do we meet in the theater and we well they mentioned, identify person by yeah and, and oswald also had some one dollar bills in his uh, apartment that were only half half a dollar bill he had two or three in his in his room well they so they, they mentioned um uh someone mentioned in the jfk form thing on facebook they mentioned that how would he get past someone if he didn't have a ticket and i just mentioned like i work front desk and many times you're supposed to stop somebody and necessarily do i do that no i get a little well, the bit ticket the ticket go. collector which burrows he said he'd, he bought a ticket that he had a ticket I mean, I, I'd say that people was, are, are good it, to go and then they still walk <laughs> in, you know, I yeah, mean, it, no, he see he, his story was he bought, he sold him a ticket or he, he collected the ticket, not sold it to him when he came in. So Julia, Postle, why, why would he not buy a ticket if he's got money in his pocket and it only cost 30 cents or something back in those days? I think it was actually it, less than that, but it was, it was Julia Postal who was supposed yeah. to be the person who sold him the ticket. Right. And then right. Butch Burroughs was supposed to collect a ticket once he right. died. Yeah. He said he collected one and she didn't remember selling him one. Although several times when she was questioned about that, she broke into tears. She acted really bizarre. Uh, and it was because Brewer, the uh, shoe store guy called her sign said, this guy went in without paying. I have a kind of a thing. Uh, Bill and I were talking about this. In my book, I discovered that there was another shoe store. <laughs> there were two of everything. There were, there were two shoe stores. And this other shoe store was run by this guy named Lowry. And Lowry was the Herb Philbrick of Dallas. He was the Herb Philbrick of Dallas. He, he started and was a member of the local uh, Communist Party in Dallas, which was about six people. 
and he was like Herb Philbrick. He was working in a shoe store. He was a spy for the FBI, and he was working. Uh, he was a member of this Communist Party, and they met at the YMCA. And he thought that maybe Oswald had attended some of their meetings because Oswald stayed at that same Oak Cliff uh, CI, uh, YMCA. So he came out of the closet at about the time that Oswald went to Mexico City. And he came out and said that he was a spy for the FBI and they, uh, he had destroyed the local Communist Party. Well, what starts, and it, it, he collected $200 a month from Hosty, <laughs> met him on street corners. And that was the original story uh, that, that, uh, that Oswald may have been an informant and that Hosty was his connection. So here you go. I mean, here you got Oswald, who's I, idle as a child, was Herb Filbert. <laughs> and here you've got this other shoe store, you know, with this same Herb Filbert type guy. And then you've got the Paines, who had maybe these file cabinets in their basement with all these connections to uh, people who were Cuban, who were interested in Cuba or communists or you know, like files on them. So I'm thinking to myself, I wonder, wouldn't it be something if there was this little cabal and Hosties involved and the Paines and Lowry and Oswald and they're, they're trying to uh, get communists to come out of the woodwork and they're, you know, that's what they think they're doing or whatever. It's just too much of a coincidence that this is all going on in this area. So what if Oswald bought a ticket, went in, couldn't find what he who was and gets panicky and he decides to go out and he goes to the wrong shoe store <laughs> instead of going to see lowry he goes in the brewer's store and he says well, that's not him i'm in the wrong place and he goes back into the theater without paying because he paid the first time i mean this is a scenario that i i, I kind of think might have happened i mean I, there's no way to prove it or anything i think uh but this, Paul, paul's got to go yeah, hey, I just wanted to plug Gary's book too. There's full mm -hmm. of nuggets like that. I, I had the pleasure of reading it. And uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, it was nice to be on the panel, guys. I have to go. Uh, thank you, Robbie, so much for inviting me. And, uh, you know, you can do it again sometime. Uh, so take care, guys. And uh, take care, hope, Paul. Take care. I'll see, I'll see you this weekend, Paul. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, what <laughs> kind of cocktail do you want? Uh, uh... <laughs> take care, guys. Okay. All right. Bye bye. I, I wanted to mention one other thing. Um, when they interviewed Marina after the assassination, one of the questions they asked her was, did Oswald know um, Lowry? And she said she didn't know who Lowry was. So they were interested if he was connected to Lowry. That, I mean, that's a strange question to ask other than you know what what were they thinking what was going on i just so. I, I wanted to mention because there's this new film out on netflix um about marilyn monroe and it does tie into jfk and um rfk um now i know jim you told me that was a rabbit hole don't go down that but i did <laughs> um <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's worse than a rabbit hole well, when they were mentioning that these like these instances where JFK and RFK were kind of going there separately and having a hookup session or whatever it is, I go into this point where if you look at this Zapruder film, there's just one thing I couldn't understand, which would, from talking to everyone, they said that like Jackie Kennedy was jumping on the back of the motorcade trying to pick up pieces of JFK's brain. But from the Zapruder film, I could not pick that up. I don't know if that's her account of saying that, that everyone's kind of taking. No, you can see it. Oh, in no, the you can see I it. Can't yeah. see, I couldn't see that that yeah you can see it in the film randy robertson did a really nice job uh if you've seen his presentations uh there is a piece of bone on the trunk of the car which she's reaching for and which i think it was marion jenkins at the hospital said that she handed it to him uh a piece of brain or tissue she she handed it to him when when she got to the hospital so that's true Damn, I had this whole backstory where I was like, if you, <laughs> if you imagine that, like the reason why she was jumping on the back, because I listened to O'Connelly's oh, oh, um, wife on Larry King talk about how she covered her husband, like got like laid over top of him. I know the Secret Service men did that for 
Jackie and uh, Jack Kennedy. Um, but when they turn, when she turned around, she goes, I was the only one holding my husband, you know, Jackie was on the back of the car. So I just didn't see her picking up brain chunks. But what I started thinking of with that new Netflix thing with Marilyn Monroe, it kind of depicts it like there was like the, the infidelity angle, which I go, JFK was known to be like a hey. severe Catholic. What? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah, I saying, I, this is where I started skepticizing, <laughs> no. where I start going, imagine, it's, it's kind of J- like a J- Bill Clinton and Hillary Jackie, J- Jackie Kennedy had a panic attack, okay, when she saw what happened to her husband. I mean, you can imagine, yeah. you know, w- looking at something like that, you know, right in front of you. can see her face contorts in horror, okay, when she sees what's happening. And she instinctively jumped back and tried to get a piece of his brain. And I think she even said she tried to put it back on. Okay. I, you I know. thought she said she didn't even remember doing any of that. Oh, she uh, did? She didn't okay. even remember going onto the onto the right. trunk or anything. They told her yeah. they told her she did, but it was Clint Hill pushed her back in. And that's what right. I'm saying. If she's talking about grabbing a brain chunk from the back, but then you're saying that she doesn't remember the whole thing. I start going into this aspect of like during the the imagine. You just found out that you're that this was going on with, like, like I said, from the, the the Netflix thing with Marilyn Monroe. I said, just bear with me for a second. Bear with me. And then you think that's going on. There's a lot of stuff like Hillary Clinton, for instance. No, no. Look, that, the, that that's what happened to her when okay. she arrived in Washington and Ben Bradley and his wife at that time met with her. She actually tried to describe what the hell happened. OK. You know, but it's very clear, in my opinion, and I'm not a psychologist or anything. I think that Jackie was, uh, as a result of this, was a PTSD, one of the first examples of that kind of thing. Okay. You know, and this is why Bobby Kennedy uh, didn't even want her to testify for the Warren Commission and insisted that he be there. Okay. Well, I, and he wouldn't testify, but he was there when Jackie Kennedy uh, did. And and if you also recall, I believe it's on November the 29th that Bobby and Jackie have Walton come over to Hickory Hill, okay? And they give him this secret letter, okay? That they want to get to Bolshakov and then Bolshakov would give it to the Kremlin, you know, which, by this time, it was pretty clear they understood what had happened. You know, there's, there's been a domestic right wing conspiracy. You know, Oswald might have been a part of it, but he was not the motivating factor behind it. OK, as a result, they, they taught that my husband and you had been pursuing will go on the back burner because Johnson is too friendly to big business. Bobby will then go ahead, leave the Department of Justice. All right. And he will then in the future run, you know, for uh, for a position. And at that time, you'd be able to pursue it again. Of course, we know what happened. <laughs> yeah. And it looked yeah. like Bobby Kennedy was going to be able to pursue it with them. You know, he uh, he's the one who gets shot. You know, one thing one thing bothers me, and Larry, you or or, or Jim can maybe straighten it out. So this the right wing cabal kills Ken- Kennedy and wants to blame it on Castro. Why didn't we invade Cuba? Why didn't what? I mean, why didn't we invade Cuba? Why didn't? Oh, you know, I mean, they had the all the, they I had think... the Mexico City thing. They had proof that that's what you know that's what happened that he that Oswald went down there, met with Kostikov, and 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 they're, they're behind the assassination. Why didn't we invade Cuba? Because I I and I think Larry will agree with me on this. The um, Johnson didn't want that. Okay. And so Johnson, uh, you know, basically tells Russell and, uh, Warren that, yeah. you know, look, I don't want this to happen. I don't want us to blame this, you know, and because it, it might cause an atomic war that, right. and he actually had McNamara put together a schedule, you know, and an estimate chart. Okay, that will kill 40 million people, you know, in the first hour. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, the question I have is. And I don't think you can answer this question. 
Did Johnson really believe that stuff coming out of Mexico City? You know, no, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, well, I, see, I, I can't answer that question one way or the other. You know, it, 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 I think I, he used he used that to get Warren. And, and OK, so you think that that's what it I was. think I think. So. But uh -huh. I can't you know, I mean, here's this right wing cabal that's so powerful. Um, how did they not get their way with uh, they wanted Cuba? Back. All of a sudden, Cuba is not important anymore. And Vietnam is. And you know. I, Gary, no, I, I, always... I, I, I think Johnson, Johnson, I think Johnson and Hoover really did not want to go that route. And so they decided to make Oswald into this lonely sociopath. I think Larry will agree with me on that, you know. I, I, I would say that's correct. Two answers, I think. Uh, Cuba was not important to Johnson. Uh, Vietnam was important to Johnson. Uh, I don't think, I think that Johnson knew within I suspected within 24 hours and absolutely knew within 48 hours that there had been a domestic conspiracy, probably within the CIA. I think there was, I think there were, even, even though the stuff out of Mexico City fell apart so quickly. I mean, let's, let's look at the first call he has with Hoover. The first call he has with Hoover, Hoover is telling him, Oswald was in, you know, impersonated in Mexico City. Obviously, there are other people involved with this. And after that first call, that the conspiracy never comes back. Johnson never, never plays that card again. Uh, he, we have absolute proof that there were other telephone calls between Hoover and Johnson that didn't enter the record. Uh, kind of like the national security meeting we talked about earlier when the films are, are the storyboards are shown to Johnson. I don't, I don't know that they knew, but I think they very well suspected there was a conspiracy, could have been domestic, that I doubtful that it was foreign. They didn't want to go there. That's my view, is it's too dangerous to go there. We don't, we don't want to find what we may very well find. Let's, let's just, we need a lone nut. And so Sunday, it was a lone nut. Uh, Gary, as far as your part of the question, it's interesting because the people that I've looked at most closely as being directly involved, even themselves eventually came to be, believe that there were two agendas in play, that what they were being told about this starting a war with Cuba was what they wanted and what they wanted to believe, but that they eventually became to suspect that all, that somebody above them had another agenda, which was just killing JFK. So you know, they and, were using, they were using the Cubans. Which, <laughs> and Cubans which is classic. were thinking, we're going to get Cuba back. <laughs> yeah, which is classic okay. case officer stuff. I mean, case officers would always tell their surrogates that, go do this dirty stuff and the revolution will start tomorrow and we'll be there. And they did and they were never there. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the $6 million question. Did Oswald really do you really go to six Mexico? million? You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did he go to Cuba? Did he go? I mean, did he go to Mexico City? Really? Oh well, I think me and Larry are going to have a disagreement about this. But in in my opinion, I think the preponderance of the evidence says no. Okay, you're in the Mark Lane Park there. And, and no, I'll, I'll I, edge no, on this. Actually, <laughs> actually, what I what what what. I believe is that uh, the stuff that David Joseph has put together on that issue is, is, is very powerful that came out of the ARB. I think I, Mark Lane is, is a good writer and, and he's a very good polemicist, but uh, David is the guy who really collected this information and put it into a package. Yeah, I, I, would agree with, I would agree with that. I would, my suspicion is this. My suspicion is that Oswald might actually have crossed the border into Mexico. Uh, but the whole story, and, and David has done a good job, the, the official story of what happened with Oswald in Mexico City is bogus. And the reason it's bogus is the CIA actually controlled the Mexican government sources that gave the information to the FBI. So even if, if Oswald went across the border, even if he was in Mexico, I absolutely would agree with Jim. He was not at the embassy. That whole thing was a 
a political action thing being run against the embassy. And it was an impersonation and I expect the individual was an Amot. It seems that I re that he signed something in Mexico, a ticket or a, a, a hotel register or something. And they said it's his his signature. So the, that the, the hotel it, de commercial, is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah. OK, well, that's an interesting story in and of <laughs> itself. OK, because as as many people have said, there's something very odd about that register is that all the other names are in a certain script. But the Oswald name is always in the same script. <laughs> it's always in the same script. And the FBI was going nuts trying to get somebody uh, to say he was at the Hotel de Comercio. And so they, they, they brought back the maid, I think, two or three times, okay, in order to convince her that, 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 he, was, that he was there. I, I'd like to go back to a previous question, which I think is very interesting. As, as we talked about, Johnson intimidated Warren and he tried to intimidate Russell to go along with this story. It's very interesting the way they reacted. Warren was simply petrified. Okay, and if you take a look at the first meeting of the Warren Commission, Warren doesn't want to do anything. Okay, I, he doesn't even want to call witnesses. Okay, you know, and, and he's just completely intimidated. Russell has a very different reaction, which I think is one of the most interesting stories that's come out in recent years, is that he has kind of the opposite reaction. You know, Sylvia Marr once said, well, look at Russell. He only went to seven meetings. Well, that's because he didn't believe what these guys were doing. It, at one of the very first meetings, he writes a note to himself saying, this is very weird. Cats and back and Warren seemed to know everything that's going to happen, et cetera. So what he did is he conducted his own investigation, okay, which is really kind of remarkable, you know, considering what the rest of those bozos were doing, you know. And then what clearly happened is that they were ready for him at the last meeting, okay. They knew what he was going to do, and they did this charade by putting some, I don't know who she was, probably some secretary there, you know, to make like she was making a stenographic record of that last meeting, when in fact, there is no stenographic record of that last meeting, okay? You know, so, but I mean- Jim, I, I, think there's, I think there's an easy explanation for this. Russell's an old time politician. He knows yeah. he can't trust Johnson about anything. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Warren, he was Warren's best gullible, friend. right? He's a justice. <laughs> Russell knows he should be skeptical about anything Johnson puts together. <laughs> well, he had a ticket, didn't he, a, for a bullfight or something among his effects when he uh, it was in Ruth Payne's garage. <laughs> uh, so he had, to, if that's real, then he had to have been in Mexico City. But I agree that he wasn't at the embassies. He couldn't, it couldn't have been, it wasn't him. Well, I got one last question that I kind of want to ask, which okay. is yeah, about, I, I, I have I know, to go. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, with the grassy knoll, uh, more people ran to the grassy knoll than the book suppository building, but you get your accounts of everyone ran to the book suppository building, at least from documents and stuff like that. It just talks about, I mean, not documents like official commission or government documents. I'm talking about like the official report that anybody could look up online and it's going to be the top search result. Now I've addressed this before that I think what gets more media attention is the things that agree with the narrative, such as like, for instance, Oliver had to go overseas from the UK to get funding for his film, as well as uh, stars picked it up as well too. It's a great film. He did an excellent job. And Jim, you did a great job writing um, all of it. It's very, very detailed. So I trust your opinion. Um, out of any, any Facebook forum person's opinion on JFK or LHL. But when you look this stuff up, like I said, as a t me 24 looking into the record and diving into the JFK thing, there's a lot of chokeholds or what Paul called chokeholds in this case which I just consider alternate plans. I mean, different methods of how this could have ended or how this could have went this way. And the one that we are talking about now and the one that we've addressed the official narrative is the one that they 
that's that came to fruition all the other ones kind of died off which you can get lost in but i i think when we talk about like the grassy knoll for instance i mean there's a lot of people that ran over there and people that heard shots come from over there but then everyone always addresses oh you're talking about like the umbrella man or whoever that you can't even tell that looks like a person but i've mentioned this a couple of times before and i've mentioned this with dale myers and all others that i speak to they say you can't with the zapruder film you can't tell that jfk is looking at a camera or something like that i got it mistaken it was another film on the motorcade where jfk is waving and he stops and he looks and he makes eye contact and his hand comes down and his face drops i mentioned this a couple of times because if you would have now known that there was prior assassination plots he was already thinking that it might happen again so it caught it, it to me, that was just interesting, and I think it's something that should be an important detail that should, people should be aware of. And I understand people would say you can't read body language. No, but if I pulled up the, if I could pull up the photo right here that I, I have, it, it's a hundred percent like someone that looks like they know something bad's about to happen. And I don't know, based on cameras back then, if they were big, if you were holding something over your shoulder or something. But to me, it was just an interesting thing that adds more weight to the fact that there is definitely some type of insider thing that goes on with it, especially if you count the prior assassination plots. I don't know, because I'm, I'm, I've never advertised myself as an expert on the Zapruder film. So I'm I'm not familiar with that. Is are you talking? Is that the, what Oliver shows at the beginning of his feature film? And yeah, then he cuts away from it. Yeah, where he's driving. Where the oh, American okay, okay, yeah. Robbie showed me the the picture last time I was on with him, and it's not in it's not from Dealey Plaza. It's it's in a motorcade and it's somewhere else. It may have been that day on another street or something, but it's a picture I had. It, it's oh, not okay. in the it's it's not in the uh, Zapruder film. He never does that in the Zapruder film, but he is looking at something and he has a strange look on his face, but I, it's not in Dealey Plaza. So it was at, an, at another time. So who knows? I mean, I think he knew he was a marked man. I mean, he, he, he made so many references to if a lone, if a guy wants to kill me, all he has to do is get in a building with a rifle and trade his life for mine. So he, he, he knew he was in trouble. But well, well, thanks, Robbie. I enjoyed yep. being on, and I and these these guys are legends. I appreciate the time, guys. <laughs> I seriously do. I respect all of you guys very much. Um, okay. Where can people find your links, uh, Larry? You want to go first, Gary, and then Jim. Best place to do look for my work is on Amazon. Quite frankly, I, and I have a I do a blog on WordPress, so you can look for Larry Hancock on WordPress. But uh, the books are all up on Amazon. Gary? I have a website, theotheroswell.com. And it's mostly about Robert Webster. And there's a lot of pictures and photos. And I wrote some uh, articles. And there's an article on there that, uh, that I wrote with Paul. And uh, you can get my books there and whatever. Jim? It's also, I'm also on a books on Amazon and Barnes and Noble too. Jim? All right. My, my website is kennedysandking.com which deals with uh, all four assassinations of the 1960s. And uh, my books are, are on Amazon. I have another, I have one coming out, I think next month, which is the sort of like the book of the film. Okay, it's the references that I used uh, for JFK Revisited. That will be coming out in a hardcover next month. Jim, I saw the short version, but I didn't see the long version. Oh, yet. you didn't see uh, the long version? Gary, come get... on. <laughs> That's I didn't know where to get it. I don't it's know on, where to see it. It's on Amazon. Okay. Yeah, the four the four hour you can't you can't buy it. You have to rent it. You stream it. Yeah. You rent it. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll send yeah. you okay, a link, so Gary. I just you. go on Amazon and type in uh, Destiny Betrayed. JFK Destiny Betrayed. And it'll pop up. Yeah, it should, long, it should the long, the long version. I'll right. send you a yeah, link, okay. Gary. I'll send you a link, and I'll link please, all the links in please. the description. Um, Ken, Thank you. Shout out to Kennedysandkings.com. Um, it's a great site; has a lot of useful information in there as well. Too. Yeah, I really like the short version, so the long version's got to be better. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks everybody for listening to this episode of Out the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.